is taking up his case. The LA Innocence Project is representing Peterson. Attorneys are seeking DNA testing from what they say is new evidence, including a burned out orange van with a stained mattress inside and a burglary across the street from the Peterson home, both from around the time Lacey Peterson disappeared at eight months pregnant. Lacey was reported missing on Christmas Eve in 2002. Her body and the couple's fetus washed ashore months later. Prosecutors focused on Scott Peterson's affair. In 2020, his death sentence was overturned because of issues with potential jurors. Peterson was resentenced to life without parole and has maintained his innocence. Kristen Wright, NPR News. On Wall Street, the Dow Jones Industrials are up 238 points. The Nasdaq is now up more than 200 points. You're listening to NPR. Good morning. With the latest from the GBH Newsroom, I'm Henry Santoro. At least 25% of young professionals living in greater Boston plan to leave the area within the next five years. More details from GBH's Mark Hers on a new survey from the Greater Boston Chamber of Commerce Foundation. People in the 20 to 30 year old range cited the unreliability of public transportation, and many said it's hard to build community here, especially for LGBTQ people. That group and young black women are even more likely to plan to leave Greater Boston. A key factor for dissatisfaction was the region's housing crisis, including both high rent and the inability to buy a home. The chamber says it's crucial that the region is made more livable for younger adults. Some young people also said nightlife needs to be improved. Improved, and that poor work-life balance is another deal-breaking factor. In Boston, I'm Mark Hers, GBH News 89.7. Rachel Rollins, the former U.S. attorney for the District of Massachusetts, has a new gig. It's a part-time position at Roxbury Community College that pays $96,000 a year. According to the Commonwealth Beacon, Rollins started the job earlier this year. She resigned from the U.S. attorney's job after federal watchdogs found that she lied to investigators and attempted to meddle in a local election. We're told her new job will be working on a new program geared towards formerly incarcerated people with a focus on women of color. In sports, the Celtics in Utah tonight for a game against the Jazz. Exhibition baseball, Red Sox play St. Louis at Fenway South today. Sunny mid-50s around here. 44 degrees right now. This is GBH News. Support for NPR comes from NPR stations. Other contributors include the Kresge Foundation. Established 100 years ago, the Kresge Foundation works to expand equity and opportunity in cities across America. A century of impact, a future of opportunity. More at kresge.org. Marjorie Egan, you're listening to Boston Public Radio 89.7 GBH. We are broadcasting live from the Boston Public Library, streaming at youtube.com slash GBH News. Oh, thank you very Marjorie, much. Marjorie, you don't have to applaud for yourself. I'm applauding for that's... myself, Jim. Somebody's going to do it. <laughs> streaming at youtube.com oh slash GBH News. Oh, no Facebook today? I guess no Facebook today. Anyway, from 1 to 2, uh, the mayor of the city of Boston, Michelle Wu, will be here with us at the Boston Public Library, taking our questions and yours. Uh, Back at the BPL tomorrow, we will be with the CIA's former chief of disguise, Joanna Mendez, and we're going to have live Irish folk music from the Burns' Brian O'Donovan Legacy Series. Hello, Jim. Hi. Do you think Mayor Wu is going to applaud for herself when she gets here? I don't think so. No, but we'll applaud. We'll give her a big round of applause. So on a brand new Pew Research poll, it was just released yesterday, a whopping 72% of teens say they feel peaceful and happy without their smartphones. (laughs) And nearly half of them say their parents are at least sometimes distracted when they're trying to speak with them. And about four in 10 teens acknowledge they spend way too much time on their phones and are trying to cut back on overall use and on social media. In a related development, Congress, as you know, is weighing a ban on TikTok. The House is expected to vote this week, barring the social media platform, banning it, if it doesn't cut ties with its China-based parent company. So we want to talk to you about two things. We're mostly interested in overall phone use by kids and parents. Are you having conversations with your family about how to cut down on screen time? If you are, how's it gone? And of lesser importance, I think, to us today, even though it's a huge national story, you know, we know that Instagram damages teen self-image. TikTok and Facebook are both known to spread misinformation or worse. And the two front runners for president, well, they're the nominees essentially, aren't making the politics any easier. Biden said he would sign the TikTok ban after he opposed it. 
Congressman Trump, who tried to ban TikTok when he was president, has now come out against the ban. And it's just a coincidence that a major Republican donor owns part of, uh, <laughs> of uh, TikTok. So the lines are open at 877-301-8970. Have you had an intervention with uh, your kids for using their phone too much? Or are you really uh, the problem? How do you balance the need for information, which is increasingly found that little machine in your back pocket with your own uh, mental health and sanity? 877-301-8970 is our number. I must amend something I said at the beginning. We are both streaming at youtube.com slash GBH News and Facebook.com slash GBH News. I thought we had been on Facebook today, but I was wrong. Did you see that? Uh, by the way, I was stunned by this, and I was mostly stunned not because of the culture of phenomenon, but because of income and how expensive smartphones are. This Pew thing said 95% of teens have access to a smartphone. 95%. Were you surprised the number is no, so high? No, no, because I think that, the, that you are out of it in school now if you don't have a smartphone, and it starts much earlier. The teen years, I mean, I know a lot of parents who've got cell phones for their kids who are 10, 11 years old in middle school. Um, but, you know, they um, in this Pew finding, I, I don't think anybody can be surprised at this, that it may be good for your hobbies, uh, but it's very bad uh, for socialization. Um, four in 10 parents and teens report arguing with each other mm -hmm. about how much time parents are spending on the phone the kids are mad about, and the parents are mad, uh, mad about how much kids time kids are spending on phones. And there was a great, uh, I, I thought, uh, op-ed written by someone named Pamela Paul, who's wrote an opinion column for the New York Times, talking about how we're really lying to ourselves. That is, the parents here who are saying that, you know, this is going to make our kids safer walking, walking to school because if they get run over by a bus, they're not going to be able to call us and, or text an us point, and Marjorie. point these things out. And it's going to give our kids a sense of independence. Well, it really won't because all the mistakes that we uh, might have made, like forgetting your homework or forgetting grandpa's birthday or all those things that parents are reminding each other, uh, uh, minding their kids of uh, on their text it's messaging. It's the opposite of independence. Exactly. You're tethered to your parents. Exactly. She says, we may genuinely believe all these little lies, uh, but we must, but really maybe we just love the convenience and, um, and we let ourselves and our children off. You know, hook. part of the problem, do you believe it is controversial? I hate to say something good about Florida, but do Florida's you believe- way ahead. Do you believe that it is controversial to ban cell phones during the school day, which Florida has done, individual communities like Portland, Maine have done, but what's the controversy? Why does a kid need a because cell phone? Because we're gonna get calls from parents today and texts from parents today who said they wanna be able to be in touch with their kids in case of an emergency. Yeah. They wanna be able to be in touch with their kids to pick them up after school or whatever it is. I mean, it's, it's, it's crazy. I, you know, all these teachers- Well, by the way, turn the phone on at the end of the day. I have no problem with well, that. While you're in school during the school day, turn, take, either take the phone or turn well, the damn you, phone you, off. you gotta take the phone because if you think kids aren't gonna turn their own phones off. Excellent point. So a lot of places they do put them away at the beginning of school in these secure packets and they get it at the end of the day. I mean, I don't think there's any doubt about it. Teachers are saying the kids are, you know, going online, buying stuff, playing games, all during school, and it's not a very good you know, idea. But, and the, the interesting thing to me, I think all of us would agree that it'd be better if our kids uh, spent less time with their cell phones. The most significant part of this to me, well, the self-recognition by teenagers that they feel better, 70-some percent feel yeah. better when they're not tethered to their phone is significant. What's also significant and not that surprising is uh, uh, parents who proselytize about the dangers of cell phones. They don't even talk to their damn kids because their heads at <laughs> one of our colleagues who shall remain unnamed was mentioning uh, this person's particular parents at the dining room table, you know, always with their heads buried in their cell phones. And as these kids say, I think the number is 46%. We're saying when they do try to talk to their parents, which is pretty odd for teenagers, <laughs> they can't because the parent is distracted by the cell phone. 877-301-8970. So we'd love to hear from you about your kids' use, what you're doing about it, are you concerned about it, do you have an understanding with them, and your own personal use and whether or not your hypocrisy, most of us are hypocrites about this, about telling your kid that they have to be less immersed in their cell phone while you are fully immersed in yours has been a problem. 877-301-8970. You know, one of the things um, I really noticed is when my kids were little, um, they, I didn't have a cell phone yet. And you take them to the park, and you'd be sitting with them in the park. Well, watching. you didn't, you said. Yes. Okay. Uh, you had a cell phone much before I did. You had one I did. I wanted the ones with the size of a 
briefcase, right. I know. Um, it was incredible. But you, you take your kids to the I park, did. and it was kind of a break. You'd watch them put sand in the bucket and turn the bucket over and put sand in the bucket and turn. It was kind of a zen experience. You know, you watch them going back and forth in the swing or whatever it was. And now that I've got a little uh, grandkid, you go to the park now, everybody's on of their course. cell phones. Not only on their cell phones at the park, but on the way to the park, in the stroller, they got the cell phone going above the stroller. And the kids, of course, are into it when they're like a year old because they can see the lights and the, and the flashing of the cell phone, and they can see that mom and dad are always on it. So they're wanting to have the cell phone to play with when they're still toddlers. Now you buy, less than toddlers even, when they're like a year old. Now you buy, the, the kids all have the, the play cell phones uh, so that they can be placated. Yeah, but the kids complain because they can't get porn on those. So that's a... <laughs> That's a problem for young kids. 877-301-8970. Before we get to the calls, how do you deal with long periods of time when you're not using your cell phone? Are you more peaceful? Or are you? I mean, you well, lose you know, your cell phone I, almost every day, so I do, obviously. I turn off my cell phone a lot, and then I what forget What are you to, talking about? I do. I have never, ever called you where it went immediately to voicemail. Not once in the you 25 crazy. years of well, working it, together. When you, okay, turn the sound off. Turn the sound oh, off. Oh, turning the yes. sound off. I thought you meant turning it off. You have many times called me when I said I didn't get the call because I turned the sound and off. And by the way, I'm still angry about it. I want to be clear. 877. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot about that. 877-301-897. By the way, you are a, a relatively, what's the word I should use? Uh, you are an anxious person? kind of person at yeah. times. Okay. Do you feel calmer when you're not constantly checking or using your phone? You do, right? I, I, I think I'm kind of a Luddite. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't really like a lot of things because it's a constant disruption. And when I used to have to write for the newspaper on deadline, you could, ne you had to turn your cell phone off. Otherwise, you could never concentrate long enough to write a story. And that's the other thing I think is happening to people: their concentration is shot from these constant interruptions. You can't concentrate and do anything with your total attention when you're looking at your text messages or you're b getting beat by emails. Can I tell second. one more story before we take the calls? I, I am, uh, I am really tethered. I'm, I'm tethered as much. As as most Here's teenagers are. Wait, let me just say this. What? I told you this a couple of years ago. I was in Costa Rica, I don't know, six or seven years ago. And in Sa I looked it up in advance. In San Jose, which is the capital city, mm -hmm. you have cell phone service. But in some echo lodge where we ended up, you don't. And I was really anxious about it. So for a whole week, no cell phone. And obviously, because of I do have a small sense of self-importance. I know if you've never done, you've I know, probably never, never noticed never that. Never noticed that. I said, this is going to be a disaster, not just for me, but for all the people who, quote, need me. <laughs> and the week's over, you get back to San Jose, San Jose, and your 16,000 emails download and all your texts. And it's true. Not one of them, uh, not one of them, uh, uh, was a problem waiting a week to respond to. You know, Mary from Weymouth just sent the, the, the thing that you hear all the time. Schools, uh, there's a school that locks up phones but gives a phone that could only receive calls from parents if there's an emergency. It's this ridiculous. is the biggest fallacy. Ridiculous. Because if there is an emergency, the parents can call the principal's office and inform them of the emergency. If dad dropped dead or grandma dropped well, dead. Well, it's a little late if they drop dead. I mean, it's, well, what are you going to do yeah, about but, it? Well, they just you're not going to bring them you're back. You're going to come home. They're going to take the kid out of school and the kid's going to come yeah, home. But it's still um, going to be dead. Dead. What is the emergency yeah. that they need to have instantaneously on their cell phone? I, I'm with you. What are you arguing? I totally agree with you. Lily in Boston, you're first on Boston Public Radio. We're talking about cell phone obsession, both kids and parents. Hi. Hi. How are you doing? Good. Good. I teach um, freshman English at Wentworth Institute oh, great. of Technology. Oh, great. Great. And a few of the students who almost did together, boys, said to me a few times, that they really want to extricate themselves from their social media and their phones because they think that it would be a much better life if they weren't constantly glued to it and filtering everything through that medium. And they asked me one time, how was it? Was it better back when you were young? And I the said, olden days. Yeah, it was. <laughs> No, wait, let me understand something. But, they think they'd be better off if they weren't using it. So do they have enough self-control to not use it or... Are they complaining they about their... They, they, they take bets with each other that they won't last a day. Yeah. But <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to encourage it maybe, you know, a, a few days without it and see how it goes. Maybe they can write about it afterwards. That's a great idea. Isn't that challenge? 
Lily, well, report back call. to us. Let us know how it goes. Thank you for the call. Okay. Appreciate it. You know, this Pew right. study says okay. teen girls are more likely than yeah. boys to say they spend too much time on their phones and social media. And although most teens of any sex can't cut back on their phone or social media use, girls are more likely than boys that to do it. That doesn't surprise me. Why does, that not, why sh why does it not surprise me? Um, it, it surprises me because I would have thought girls would be more, want to be more in touch with their girl group, you know, and they didn't want to miss out on anything. But uh, apparently that's, that's not true. Let's go to Fall in South Boston. Hi, Fall. Hey, Fall. Hey, how's it going? Good, how are you? Uh, so I guess I, I'm, I'm kind of along the lines that I, I would agree that trying to uh, prohibit the use of phones during the school day would probably be the best thing. Because um, I feel like we, we know that like phones and social media are all designed to be addictive. So it's, it's kind of similar to like vaping or smoking cigarettes that if we can try and prom promote healthier behaviors at a younger age, we might have like a better future for those people down the road. Yeah, uh, I, I, I don't think that's anything. This should be controversial. Every word you said, full, is absolutely true. And you know, I, Marjorie and I, in terms of school, full. Thanks for the call. You know, we debate. We don't debate. We both agree there should be longer school days. We both, I think, I, we agree. It's a complicated process. It requires a lot of people coming together and making agreement. It shouldn't be this hard. How hard is this? Just say you can't use them during the day. And the well, fact that a few parents say, as you say, that they won't be able to contact their kid in a nanosecond in an emergency, it'll, there'll be a five-minute delay if they need to go through the principal's office, is totally not compelling, you know? They're starting, they're starting to shut down phones in a lot of red states, actually. Maybe Massachusetts, a blue state, should follow that. You mentioned before Florida, uh, Utah, um, Portland, Maine, Arkansas. Though, is, Portland, Maine is... Kim, doing it. Uh, Kim, uh, Tim Kaine, Virginia Democrat. There's another, I think that's a purple state now, Virginia. I'm not sure. Yeah. Is it blue or purple? Mm -hmm. Anyway. Um, well, it's uh, purple because what's his face? Youngkin is the uh, governor yeah, there. Tim yeah. Kaine introduced legislation that would require a study on the effects of cell phone use in the schools, but they haven't volunteered to shut them down. 77% of United States schools say they prohibit cell phones at school for non-academic use, but that's kind of a joke because, as everybody knows, you know, the kids are able to uh, get around that when they're clever, especially if they're like at Wentworth or a whole bunch of, of engineers. Yeah, you know, before we get back to the calls, uh, uh, Jamie, of course, I assume this is you, Jamie, in this picture. Yes. Okay, AI of Jim using his cell phone in Ooh. 1980, and it was big. By the way, we didn't post this, but it, it was literally the size of a briefcase. Do you remember why I got a cell phone? Because you were a very important person. No, Jim, that is not correct. And we're afraid that people wouldn't be able to I was them. about to debate tax policy at a big debate in Framingham. Uh-huh. And uh, I didn't get there for reasons I will not discuss it. And Barbara Anderson, who I was debating, yep. head of Citizens for Limited Taxation, the headline in whatever the newspaper is for Metro, Metro West, whatever it's called, uh, then Framing, Daily News it the or Framingham something. Paper no, then? it was Metro West something. Other. In any case, the headline on page one was Anderson Debates No Show. Yeah. And my board was a little upset, so I got a cell phone. <laughs> and honestly, as I said, this is 1990. Jim is on page one. Oh my God. A very important person. Yeah, as yeah, no just, show. That's so really important. Sneak that I am story not exaggerating. <laughs> the cell phone was as big as this computer. Yep. It was unbelievable. So, we used to do a television show together, Jim, and occasionally give me a ride back after the television show. Yeah. And the moment we got in the car, you immediately get on your cell phone. I had to make people sure. I had to talk to. <laughs> you talked on a cell phone. I had people I had to talk I'm to. I'm sitting there like a potted plant. You know, he's ignoring me completely. Marjorie doesn't even know the cell phone wasn't even powered on. I was just trying to impress her by all the people I was allegedly <laughs> speaking with. Jim, in Brookline, you're next on Boston Public Radio. We're talking about cell phone obsession. Hey, Jim. Yes. Yeah. I think there was, somebody ought to create an, an in-school app that simply must be on every uh, kid's uh, uh, telephone, and it automatically can turn them all you're off genius. and let them use it in an emergency. A great opportunity for an app. Number two, in my family, we always have a cell phone at the dinner table to make sure that when a question comes up and we want to argue over different possibilities, oh we can God. look it up in Wikipedia immediately and get a real answer. Please don't laugh, you guys. We are laughing. It's too <laughs> late. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, did you hear my second one? No. Yes. What was it? No, I didn't hear the second one. Oh. What was it? No. No. And 
So the first one was the app. And the yeah. Second oh, one. yeah, yeah. yeah. So at look, the table. Out. That's so what we were laughing out. at, even yeah. though you didn't want us well, to. Well, you know, a lot of us have been guilty yeah. of that. I've okay. been guilty of that, too. When I can't remember something, I immediately Google it so I can remember the details. But, but you know, maybe I should just sit a while and go for my brain for a little bit longer. Jim, thanks for the call. Love the app, Here's at a good least. One. We're 50% with you. Thank Everyone, you. Oh, and by the way, in one of these stories, I talk about how uh, teachers are contributing to this, too, or schools. How so? I didn't well, see because, that. Well, because they say you have to get have, you know, the little... Um, uh, they want you to take pictures of your homework assignments and stuff like that. They almost require that you have phones in schools to do certain tasks that they want you to do, like pictures of your homework. Why can't they email it to you? Why can't they take a picture and email it to every kid in the class? I, I don't know. That's what they say. And here's a, someone saying, that, and this is so true, this person says they play a little game while they're driving their car called Who's on Their Phone at the Red Light? <laughs> and when you look around, there's usually at least one or two people on their phones at the red light. You know that what the law is in Massachusetts? It's against the law. For driving. Drivers, right. And yep. uh, you ever see a driver, a red light, who's not uh, using his or her phone? Lots of people are looking Lots at their of phones. People. I don't do it anymore, by the way. Well, that's, that's swell. Okay. <laughs> Melissa from Holliston. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> I really appreciate your support Melissa from that. Holliston. Hey, Melissa. Thank you for calling. Hello there, Melissa. Hi. Uh, hi. Hi, how are you? Excellent. I think the app idea is a great idea, by the way. Um, I was going to say fubbing. Phone Snubbing is huge. It affects every relationship, parents and, um, and child, uh, many men and women in their relationships or any type of relationship you have, snubbing. What does snubbing. it mean? I don't get it. What does it mean? You're snubbing people because you're on your phone. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I, of course. I mean, I have, is there anything ruder than know. being with another human being? And being on your damn phone when you're sitting with them. I mean, that is just grotesque. How many times grotesque. do you go out to dinner Melissa, thanks. where people are both on their phones? The, 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 you know, two people are sitting at a table across from each other and they're both on their phones. Or somebody <coughs> has their phone on the table the entire time. Excuse me, excuse me. <laughs> you used to tell a story before you got such joy out of criticizing me. This uh -huh. is about 10 years ago. We had a meeting at a Chinese restaurant in, uh, well, actually, we can say the name. What's the name of the great with the chopped liver, stir-fried, whatever, where the Andalmans always go? What's the name of that? Oh, in, gosh. On, uh, Golden Temple. Golden Temple. We, were had, we had a meeting in a Golden Temple, yep. and there were two people at the next table who were not only speaking on their cell phones, but speaking loudly. That's right. And who, That's right. who got up and asked them to quiet it down? Did you? I, <laughs> I don't remember. Did you? Yes, I did, Marjorie. Yes, and what happened? What? Did it go well? They called the police, actually. <laughs> I did three to five in Brookline. I mean, yeah. really. But that's another one. Remember Lois Pines? She's the one, but I'm talking to Jamie now. She is the one that said to me, you're not going to have the courage to go over and do it. I said, yes, I am. She says, if you do it, you're going to yell at them. That's not going to be I said, no, I'm not. I'm going to be polite and do it. I did it. And she has no idea that it even happened. Okay, what are you saying? Do you remember Lois Pines? She was of course I do. Politician. State Senator from Newton. Yeah, I'll never She ran for this. lieutenant governor. Yeah, this was a long time ago, at least when she was in office. At least I remember 15, her well. 15 years ago. But I remember yeah. doing an interview with her yeah. when I was a reporter. She was on the phone? Constantly. Really? Constantly. It really, it really. Why'd you bring that up? Because I just thought of someone early on that you were surprised at. Now you wouldn't be surprised because everybody does it. It's interesting. You remember your interview with Lois Pines. You didn't even know who she was, but you do not remember something. me yep. going to the people she the was, next day. She table. was a big deal. We have to take a break. Alex, from, oops, Alex, Alex from New Hampshire. Sit tight. Sit Don't tight. go we'll anywhere. We'll be right back. We're talking about whether we should get rid of cell phones in schools and whether you feel as though cell phones are taking over everybody's entire life to a very detrimental way. You're listening to Boston Public Radio, 89.7 GBH. We are broadcasting live from the Boston Public Library and streaming at youtube.com slash gbhnews and facebook.com slash gbhnews. It's about reparations. From GBH News, I'm Soraya Wintersmith. This is What is Owed. Black Americans didn't even get the 40 acres. Instead, around that time, the government doled out 160-acre allotments to white families in the American West. White Americans were getting 160 acres. So it, 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 it was a staggering handout, if you will. What is owed? Subscribe and listen wherever you get your podcasts. Support for GBH comes from you. And the Peabody Essex Museum, presenting Our Time on Earth. This immersive exhibition celebrates the power of creativity to shape the future of our planet. Now on view. Tickets and more at PEM.org.
and Skylark Vocal Ensemble, presenting Windswept Seas, with storyteller Sarah Walker. Performances Thursday through Saturday in Falmouth, Chestnut Hill, and Newburyport. Tickets at skylarkensemble.org. Welcome back to Boston Public Radio. Jim Browdy and Marjorie Egan. We're live at the Boston Public Library, streaming on YouTube and Facebook.com slash GBH News. One o'clock today, the mayor of Boston, Michelle Wu, will join us at the library live. You can call or text the question or go right to the mic in the uh, cafe, News Suite Cafe here, and ask her a question. If you're just tuning in, we're talking about the impact of constant phone use on all of us, not just teens, adults too. So how do we all stop doom scrolling and be more present with our families? And our kids, 877-301-897. Can I just say one thing that has nothing to do what? with this? What? I, I am watching during the one-minute break CNN's broadcast mm -hmm. of this hearing with the, the uh, special counsel who is the guy, her, who said that the, he didn't indict uh, Biden in part because he was an elderly guy without much of a memory and the jury would be sympathetic, et cetera. Can you name one thing in the last six months that the Republican-led House has had a hearing on that has any impact on real people? Impeaching Mayorkas, impeaching Joe Biden, this thing to embarrass Joe Biden. I mean, do they do anything that advantages well, you know, their constituents? We were talking about how our colleagues at Frontline won an Academy Award for then their they did. 20 Days in Mariupol and about the horrors endured in Mariupol when the Russians first invaded. And you heard Trump uh, just say he's not going to give a dime to Ukraine if he becomes the president of the United States. He's just going to let... He told Orban yeah. that he was not going to nickel. Another, yeah. another great guy. Yeah. Uh, he's just going to roll over to uh, Vladimir Putin. I, it, it's just... It's hard to believe what's happened to us sometimes. But anyway, getting back to the cell phones. Sorry. Um, this study, the Associated Press is writing about this effort of more states to press for uh, cell phone bans in schools. It says that 97% um, um, of kids use their phones during school hours. 97% of kids. And they talked to this young woman. She was a freshman in college out in Utah, said, and she talks about how they take away their phones and put them in cubbies at the beginning mm -hmm. of each class she goes to in Utah. She said it would be hard to ignore her phone if it was within reach. It's a relief, I said this 14-year-old, to take a break from the screen and the social life on your phone and actually talk to people in person. And that's part of it, too, the idea that you're always looking at your phone and always planning things on your phone and you're not having social interaction. And this comes in the context of this big mental health crisis Absolutely of teenagers right. in America and a loneliness crisis of everybody in America. Alex, I'm sorry to make you wait. From New Hampshire, thank you for calling. Hi, Alex. Hey, guys. Long time no talk. Thank you. Um, for getting back to quick stories. I, I, I used to be a teacher 20 years ago. Oh. So I was in my early 20s, and the kids would always have their cell phones out under the desk. Um, yeah. Trying to be subtle about it. I'm like, put your cell phone away. Oh, my cell phone's not out. And I'm like, well, you're staring at your crutch. There's nothing else <laughs> interesting down there. <laughs> so I, I'd confiscate them after, you know, I'd give them one warning and take it. Uh, so I got a reputation, and eventually they stopped. And another time, um, some kid's phone starts ringing, really high-pitched <laughs> ringtone. I say, whose cell phone is that? Whose cell phone? Like, you can hear that? I'm like, yeah, I can hear that. It's, it's wicked loud. They're like, oh, it's a special ringtone that old people can't hear <laughs> because it's so high pitched. I'm like, I'm 24, kids. You're 17. I'm, I'm not old. <laughs> That's pretty good, Alex. Uh, That's pretty good. And then fast, fast forward 20 years, now I've got two teenage daughters. <laughs> and we agree that when they turn 13, they could get iPhones because it has to be an iPhone. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, but we'll have parental controls. Turns out, Apple, when the kid turns 13, they can disable the parental controls and that. have full access. So do so your kids... Do... Daughter turned... Oh, go ahead. You're going to answer my yeah. question. Go ahead. Yeah, so she turns 13. She gets her cell phone. She looks at her profile and says, why does Apple think I'm 10 years old? 
I'm like, haha, I got you for another three years. Oh, 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 oh you did hey, it. You're okay. A clever I get guy, it. Alex. I got it. Hey, Alex, call us again. Don't wait so long. That was great. Thanks so much for the uh, call. You know, this, other, this study also says that half of parents say they look through their kid's phone. And I think that's a bad idea, too. It's like Without, it's well, kid's diary. Unless your kid knows. I've told this story a thousand yeah. times, too. Our good friend and colleague, when her kid was, she has one of those monitors where you can right. see where your kid is and where the phone is. Remember the story? He turned 16. He was allowed to drive to school for the first time. <laughs> yeah. And she texted him and said, how's it going? Great. I'm really safe. <laughs> where are you having lunch? At the school cafeteria. So she turned on the tracking device. He was at the Capitol Grill in Burlington. <laughs> I love that. But at least he knew. I'm not into this yeah. if your kid does not. The kid knew that the tracking device was there and chose to do it anyway in any case. So I'm getting my usual text about, suppose there's a school shooting, and tragically, there are an awful lot of school shootings today. But again, is that really how you want to live your life, that your kid is going to be using the phone in school, not socializing in school? Happily, the, uh, we are still overwhelmingly in a minority of school shootings. Your school is not likely to be shot up. And it's a terrible way. And, and even then, so, okay, what? So you can text to your kid and, and risk that your kid is going to, that the shooter is going to hear the ding in the cell phone when you someone kid actually, is, someone actually texted that or you just said that? No, here's just one. This is Aaron Hopkinton. What's the emergency? How about a school shooting? But that's crazy because that would never happen in Massachusetts. Oh, wait. Let's and, go to Ed and Marlboro. I don't mean to pick on you, Aaron. I mean, you're not the only one. About 10 people have texted that. Hello, Ed. Welcome. Yeah, hi guys. Hi. Um, great show. Love you guys. Thanks. Um, I just wanted to call. It's it's about cell phones, but it's a little different subject. Sure. I drive a truck for a living. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And um, one, it's an epidemic on the roads. Everyone's got their phone in their hand. Mm-hmm. And then also, um, I see people walking dogs all the time, and I see them on their phones, and I think it's sad because that dogs are going to eventually pass away, and they're going to not even realize they had a dog. <laughs> You know what I mean? They're so, they're so distracted. I'm serious. I see it all the time. Boy, that's a great yeah. line, Ed. Oh, that is a good one. Some of the great videos, Ed, if you've, you know, they're not in vogue as much as they used to be because we've moved on to other things like animal videos or whatever it is, or Katie Britt videos are big in the last week or so since her response. You remember the videos? that from maybe 10 years ago where people would be on the cell phone. Remember the great one where the woman <laughs> walks into, into the, the fountain, fountain. <laughs> at, the, at the mall? Yeah. <laughs> people walking into party, parking meters. I mean, those or into were, manhole covers. I'd love that, yeah, by the way. Ed, that was a fabulous call on a great line. Although, Thank you so much. You know, I gotta be honest, I, I'm guilty a lot of, I listen to a lot of podcasts and when I'm walking the dog, now I'm walking my daughter's dog more than I should be, frankly. But anyway, I'm walking my daughter's dog listening to podcasts and you're trying to change the podcast while you're walking. You worried the dog is going to die and never going to know your daughter had a dog? <laughs> no, I, I spend a lot of quality time with the dog when we're uh, in the house uh, playing games and throwing balls. You know, we're going to ask about this. Just occurred to me. Mayor Wu is going to join us at one o'clock. I think her kids are seven and ten. Well, Knowing come. Mayor Wu as we do, I mean, as you know, professionally, think she her ten year old has a cell phone? No. I would bet you're probably right. I don't know. We'll find out at 1 o'clock. Okay, stick around. We are going to talk up next with NBC Sports Boston's Trenny Casey. We're going to talk about weeping in the NFL. And the U.S. women's soccer team is bouncing back in other sporting news. You're listening to Boston Public Radio 89.7 GBH. We are broadcasting live from the Boston Public Library, streaming at youtube.com slash gbhnews and facebook.com slash gbhnews. takes you outside your borders and connects you with the most important events happening all across this big blue marble. We introduce you to memorable people whose stories will stay with you for a lifetime. I'm Marco Werman. And I'm Carolyn Beeler. Global news and inspiring voices that will keep you on top of the world. Listen each weekday. This afternoon at 3, here on GBH News 89.7. Funding for our programs comes from you. And Comcast, offering the Xfinity 10G network, designed to provide a connection for home networks so everyone can be online at once, even during peak hours. Xfinity.com. And Auschwitz, not long ago, not far away, an exhibition featuring over 700 historic artifacts from the Holocaust, opening March 15th in Boston. 
More at theauschwitzexhibition.com. Welcome back to Boston Public Radio. We're live at the Boston Public Library, streaming at youtube.com slash gbhnews, facebook.com slash gbhnews. In about 90 minutes, actually a little less, the mayor will join us here for an hour of Ask the Mayor, where she'll take your calls and ours. Tomorrow, we're back at the library. Remember, we're here Wednesdays now with the CIA's former chief of disguise, which I started reading the book last night. It is really, this is going to be great. In any case, that's happening then. We're joined now at the Boston Public Library by Trenny Casey, anchor and reporter for NBC Sports Boston and a BPR contributor. Hello, Trenny. Hi, guys. Hey. Hello, Trenny Casey. Glad to see you. So everybody knows that Taylor Swift is dating Travis Kelsey. What we I don't did, say. <laughs> we don't say. That's absolutely true. But I did not know that Travis Kelsey and his brother Jason are big weepers. And perhaps they're going to send a new standard for macho men weeping all across America? Yes, so there's this. I, I just found this, this column interesting. So Jason Kelsey, who is Travis's older brother, retired from the NFL last week and held a press conference. He played for the Philadelphia Eagles and couldn't make it through like the first three minutes without starting to cry. Um, and so the New York Times noticed this and they wrote a, a column about how Jason and Travis Kelsey are sort of changing the narrative around male, male athletes. And I realized it really wasn't that long ago and they cited a couple of examples um, one was Tim Tebow, yeah, remember um, him. you know, and they called him Tierbo because he started crying. And then one of the most famous examples is Michael Jordan at his Hall of Fame induction was crying and it became this like meme called the crying Jordan. So like anytime something happens online, if you're still, you know, in like the sphere of Twitter, mostly X, um, someone will throw up like a crying Jordan um, meme and it's supposed to be sort of emasculating, right? Like here he was, he's crying, you're a baby, you're a man, you're not supposed to cry. But Travis and Jason are sort of changing that entire narrative. Um, they've openly wept on their uh, podcast, New Heights. They're seen crying on the field when one, you know, wins a Super Bowl and the other loses a Super Bowl. They played each other last year, um, not this past season, but two seasons ago now. Um, and then when Jason at his press conference started talking about what his brother meant to him and their relationship of uh, both of them playing in the NFL. Like somebody had to hand him like a towel <laughs> to like wipe the tears because he's like, this is where it's really going to get bad. And he starts sobbing. But I just think, I think it's, it's, it's interesting that they play, like they are very masculine, right? Travis Kelsey dates a pop star. Jason Kelsey goes to his brother's football game and chugs beer shirtless in the cold. That's right. Um, and, and they get, you have these two guys who their way of um, expressing themselves is very authentically and showing true vulnerability, which is it's perfectly okay to cry in this very brutal, brutal sport. You know, um, by the way, how pathetic is it that this is a story in the New York Times? That in 2024, I mean, that's fair. at a sad moment in their life, Grown men who are big time athletes are actually crying. I mean, really? But I think no, it's, it's I, not pathetic because it, it is it, pathetic. No, it's, it's, it's sort of saying what, what Trini just said. I'm not criticizing her. Macho beer chuggling uh, NFL yeah. superstars who are like enormous, weigh 600 pounds between them, can uh, you know cry. I mean, you know, Jim, I'm a big proponent of mental health, and one of the you know the spheres I think are like the the subgroups that I feel are still maybe underserved or under you know, not fully understood are, are men in particular, you know, not actually all men, I shouldn't just say white men, all men are sort of misunderstood. And there's still this idea that anger is a more appropriate form no, of emotion right. from right. a man. So is it, is it pathetic? I don't know if pathetic, sad to me is, uh, to me is a more apt, word. Sad. It's sad to That's me what I meant. Sad. that we still have to, we have to put these guys up on a pedestal and then our time and say, yay, you're not afraid to cry. That's so great. Like we haven't moved past the point where this is just seen as a normal human emotion exactly. and one that should be celebrated, not, you know. Talk about men for another minute. And we talk to you, I think every year, we have some angle on the Iditarod, oh, I love this which is, of course, the dog sledding race. That which goes, is still happening well, right now in Alaska. It is. Today yes. is, yeah, okay. They're not quite done yet. Well, I'll, I'll okay. scoop we'll, we'll And they have, enough snow. Snow. they have enough snow, I hope. Uh, apparently for this, Good. yeah. Okay, so apparently the lead guy got penalized yep, Dallas, two hours. Who's the Dallas CV. Exactly. And why did Dallas CV get penalized two hours well, in the Iditarod? he did not gut a moose properly. Exactly. <laughs> 
<laughs> so when I first saw this yes. headline, I was like, what kind of, I know everyone's a face in the audience is like, wait, did I hear her right? Did she say he didn't gut a moose right? That yes. is correct. He did not correctly gut a moose. And at first I was sort of repulsed by this, but then I read the story and it actually makes perfect sense. So he's on his sled with his sled dogs. And I don't know if anyone's ever encountered a moose before. No. I have not. They're huge. But they're huge and they're aggressive. So this moose was entangled with one of his sled dogs, which actually had to, to be taken off the sled and go get treatment. And so to protect his dog and the rest of his sled dogs, he shot and killed the moose, which is completely okay. They're, you know, it's, it's, that's what you do. But in the rules of the Iditarod, you respect the land. And this is an edible animal. This is an animal whose meat you can use and who's all part of the animal the community can use. So in order to move on in the race, you and no one behind you. So if like he would have been in a tight race with someone only five minutes, 10 minutes behind him, if they come up on him, they cannot pass him until they help him gut the moose. But he had such a large lead that no one came up on him um, and he quickly gutted the moose and he did not gut it properly, and he left part of the carcass, and like one of the sleds went over the moose, so he was penalized. Normally, when you get to the end of the stage, you have a 24-hour rest period. He had to rest 26 hours oh. as a penalty. However, he's still in the lead. He has a three-hour lead as he approaches White Mountain, which is one of the last um, stops before you uh, hit the finish line of the Iditarod. He has a three-hour lead over his closest competitor, um, and he's probably gonna win the Iditarod anyway for the sixth time in a row which would be a record. And uh, the prize for this is um, $3,000 in gold bars. I was shocked It's like it's not so very little. much money. Well, so, I mean, gold bars, I suppose, like, I don't know. I'm, I'm not into, like, selling and buying gold bars. Yeah. But. So one of the things that I think we've talked about in the past, and I can't remember what the answer is, is this cruel to the dogs that who are doing this? I or? mean, I would think if it was, it probably wouldn't exist anymore, although we still have those stupid horse-drawn carriages all over town, so maybe yeah. it would. Um, I, I, I think from what, I, what I've read and what I've seen, these are dogs that are sort of built for this. Like, I don't mm -hmm. know if you've been around Huskies, Alaskan Huskies very Not much, but much. like, they love to run, they love to be out in the snow. Um, that's why there's rest periods. Like, they can't just go constantly, right? They, it, they have mandatory rest periods and times where they have to take care of the animals. Okay, so before we I'm leave gonna, this. I'm going to be sort of pure and the think injured it's okay. dog is, is Yeah, the recovered. injured dog yeah, is recovered. That's yes. hear. And, so yeah. here's a quiz for both of you. It's Who that we know well has encountered a moose? You have not. Probably Sue O'Connor. That is exactly right. <laughs> well, she's sitting right exactly there, and I'm right. like, I feel like she encounters a lot of very weird wildlife. <laughs> Coyotes, as coyotes, we call them. Coyotes, yeah, coyotes. And meese. Uh, moose. Uh, but why, don't you live in, like, Somerville? <laughs> Just, oh, no, no, you're, you're Roxbury. Yeah, Roxbury. Still, how many mooses in Roxbury? Yeah, Roxbury. Still, a lot of mooses in Roxbury. We'll find out from her a little I, bit later. I have never seen, I think I did when I was a kid, yeah. and I know, I, I, and my husband hates when I say this, because yeah, he's like, ahead. we don't want to see a moose when we're driving. Like, they're huge, huge, dangerous huge. animals. And I'm like, can't I just see one at a distance, like, while well, I'm hiking one day, and off in the distance, drinking in the waters, this beautiful moose? You never saw a bullwinkle when you were a kid, or you did I mean, I don't think that counts. Oh, it does count. Rocky and bullwinkle? Rocky, how great were they? They oh, both. that was Rocket J Squirrel. Yes. Okay, so can we go to a really uplifting story? I never yeah. heard of this woman, I have to say. Yeah. Alyssa. Alyssa Nair? Nair. Yep. Okay, so here she is uh, with a huge save against Canada, and you can tell us the significance. It's sort of exciting. Here's the sound. The game at her feet. Save for a third time by Nair. She saved three. She converted one. Alyssa Nair has almost single handedly set the United Okay, so she saved three, and she converted one? She converted one? a PK, yes. So fill us in. <laughs> so Alyssa Nair is the goaltender for uh, Team USA, oh. the U U.S. Women's National Team, and they were playing in the CONCACAF Gold Cup, um, which is usually, it's only been for men, um, and now they've added it to the women's international play schedule, and it's, it's a crucial tournament heading, you know, heading into an Olympic year. Why, why are you guys laughing over there? I'll man? tell you in a minute. Okay. It has nothing to do with you. No, Go ahead. It's it's a, why is everyone laughing? Well, okay. let me tell you right now. It's a nickname. Now, yeah. here's the deal. Rocky and Bullwinkle caused one of our uh, producers to think of comparable figures, Boris and Natasha, and we learned a few months ago that at WBUR, our nickname is Boris and Natasha. So there you are. <laughs> we don't quite know why, but that is our name. Okay, back to okay, Alyssa Nair. Go ahead. So Alyssa Nair, yes, so she's the goaltender. Um, and so they're playing in this. Honestly, there are questions about whether or not this semifinal game against Canada. So the goal, the goal, the CONCACAF Gold Cup is North America, South America. Um, so like they played Colombia to get to the final, and now I'm forgetting who they played in the Brazil final. In Brazil. The final. Brazil. Yeah. They played yeah. Brazil in the final. Yeah. 
And they won. They won. They took gold in the CONCACAF. And a few years ago, it was actually a long time ago, um, when the men won CONCACAF, like they went on to have a very good showing in the World Cup. So it's usually an indication of how you stack up against some of the world's best teams. Um, and the further along you get, and it's set up like Olympic play. It's, it's a great tune-up to the Olympics, which of course is the summer in Paris. Um, but what's incredible is Alyssa <laughs> Nenayer not only... Um, allows just one um, shootout goal. It was a 3-1 win in a, in a shootout. She Incredible. also converted a penalty kick earlier in the game to score a goal for the United States. I've mean? never heard of that. A goalie? Yeah, a goalie kicking. Yes. I've never heard of that. I what honestly hadn't either, which just what shows you. What does converted mean? So, I mean, she, she scored the goal. Oh, she scored okay. the goal. So she's the goalie who she's wins the, goalie. the game on defense. Yes. And she takes one of the penalty kicks, which you expect to be the forwards yes. or whatever the hell. And she converts it. She That's wins. pretty incredible. Yeah, and she helps, helps them win 3-1 to one in penalty kicks. The the only like downer about this story is that the, the, the semifinal game, which went to penalty kicks, uh, went to a shootout, um, was played in a, like a deluge of rain. It was like when one of those, what are they, atmospheric rivers that happen, that have been like coming uh, over Ch or Chicago, California. The, oh, yeah, the yeah, conditions yeah. were actually unsafe, and there were people calling for U.S. soccer, for CONCACAF, for them to postpone the match. The second half was better. It kind of stopped raining, and it wasn't as bad. But, like, there have been a lot of knee injuries and issues with ACLs and stuff in soccer, and I think a lot of times women just feel like, why are you making us play in these conditions? Yeah. Like, can't, can't we just push it back? Like, we, we, and I think the question always is, if these were the men who were playing, would you push it back for them? Well, the wait a second, though. I mean, in a related story, I, I heard this when I woke up two days ago. We all know the Kansas City Chiefs are the Super Bowl champions yes. again. And most of us recall that in their road to the championship this year, the first game was a home game. I think yes. a home game yes, it against was a home Miami. Game. And Miami had a play in Kansas City yep. where the wind chill was a mere minus 27. Whatever. That's they like didn't, January well, you're, in you're Wisconsin. You're in Wisconsin, exactly. So... Uh, it's one thing to play the game. It appears, based upon reporting after the fact, that at least a handful of people who attended the game had to have fingers and toes amputated yeah. because of frostbite. Okay, I mean, but what I, well, here's, here's where I want, I want more information. Did okay. you watch the game on TV? Did you see no. how many people out there were shirtless and didn't have hats on their head? And like... What were the actions that led to you getting frostbite, right? That like, is a very good like, question. Before we are like, I can't believe the NFL played this game. Like, I remember a game in 2007 between the Giants and the Packers that is one of, to this day, one of the coldest football games on record, played at Lambeau Field. My brother went, I remember, I watched it at home at my parents' house. I remember being so cold in our house and we had like the <laughs> heat blaring because you just could not warm up. And I'm like, I, 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 Take the, there are, nest, there are things, cover your extremities. Like there are things as a responsible, at some point you have to be like a responsible human being. That's a fair point, but we don't know that it was only the exposed people no, and I don't know. who had I, amputations. I don't know, but there, there is a part of me that it feels like we just live in this like litigious society that's like, I got frostbite and now I'm gonna yell at the Chiefs for having a game. Then don't so why go, do we like have if to, it's too cold, then don't go to the game. By the way, game. Taylor Swift was there in a heated suite. She was, she was in a obviously. box, yes. So why do we need to play games in minus... 27 degrees. Why not the next day or the whatever? I mean, I suppose they could have postponed By the way, you were just in they, they, postponed it for, they postponed games for snow before. Um, and you know what? That might have... And now my memory is not serving me. I'm trying to remember if there already was a playoff game that weekend that was pushed to a Monday, and I think there was because of an extreme snowstorm. Was that Buffalo? This, yes. Possibly, this one, yeah. I think the, you're right. Oh, the it was. Green Bay Packers, it, the end of the story says in back in 1967... Oh, yeah, the ice was bowl. the famed ice bowl, yeah. yeah. Green Bay versus Dallas... Green Bay won. Yep, sure and did. It was minus 13 at kickoff. Yes, and that's the wind with, and chill the wind chill. of minus 36. Yeah. Oh. That's cold. I remember going to a game. I'm just saying, uh, we didn't have a whole bunch of stories after that about people getting their toes <laughs> amputated and their fingers amputated. Just put some gloves on. I remember going to a game at Gillette, and it was so cold. You go to the ladies' room, and the line was not for the bathroom. The line was for the for the Heater uh, for hand the warmers. hands? <laughs> yes, yeah. Oh, that's the great. Hand Women are standing in front of the hand warmers with their feet and their hands. It was so cold that day down there. It was just miserable. You yeah, know, before we leave, uh, I just realized I meant to ask you on the prior topic, which I probably shouldn't ask you on the air, but now it's too late. 
You're not going to the Olympics? Um, I am. Oh, you um, are? I, I mean, I guess I'll, I, I don't think it's not a secret. Um, I'm not going to Paris. Um, I've actually gotten, I guess it's sort of like a promotion. Uh, I'm going to oh, host a day you, part. Can you are? Uh, every day of the week, 11 a.m. to kidding? Yeah. 11 a.m. to 6 p.m. every day on E. And on the weekends, it'll be on E and CNBC. And so, like, during the week, it'll be Jesus. like, um, you know, you tune in and I toss to, uh, you know, different events or do recaps of events. But on the weekend, it'll have sort of a talk show feel to huge. it as well. Yeah, I'm super excited. Who you, doing? Who, you have a co host? I don't. It's just it's just me from uh, seven hours a day. That is on, unbelievable. So, yeah, I'm really, I just, I was like floored when they asked me. Honest, to be quite frank, I was like, I'm going to be 47 this year. I'm like, they're not going to ask, ever ask me to host. Like, at this point, I'm just, and there's nothing wrong. I loved being a venue reporter. I loved being you on did tennis. Curling and I did tennis. curling and tennis, curling for Winter Olympics, tennis for the Summer Olympics. But this was just, I was wow. honored to be asked to, to be in the studio. So I'm going to be in Stanford because we do a lot of our um, studio stuff out of Stanford, uh, which I am now calling the Paris of Connecticut. <laughs> um, but it's just an awesome opportunity. That is huge. I'm really, really excited. Thanks. That's so, yeah. really so I'll be great. part of the Olympic coverage. I just won't be actually in Paris, which um, I, um, I thought my husband might divorce me because part of the whole deal was we were going to go to pa- we were going to hang out in France after the Olympics. But <laughs> we can hang out after you it's host fine. this coverage. That it's is fine. We'll go another training. time. Paris, great. Paris will still be there. We'll talk more so, about it as we approach yeah. uh, Trent Paris. Casey, I've never heard of this before. Apparently, Lulu. Lemon makes a lot of great yoga clothes. They're not yep. cheap, but they last forever. They do. Does this six-day uh, ultra marathon race for women? So this is the first time they've ever done it. I think you know, you guys know me. I'm a, I'm a big runner, so I think this is really cool. But I think it's cool. Uh, so what's happening is it's called Further, and it's sponsored by Lululemon, and it's taking uh, place in California. And it's ten women of all different shapes and sizes and different running abilities who have been training to run an ultra marathon. So you can run as long as you need to over six days, as far as you can possibly go. Um, I, I train with a, 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 a running uh, program called Lift, Run, Perform. One of their coaches is running, but she's coming off a terrible bout of COVID and long COVID with some terrible side oh. effects. So she's only been running maybe over the six days. She'll run a little over 100 miles. There are other women who are now pushing 300 miles over this, this course um, and so what they're doing though, it's not, it's not a race for these women. Each, each person has their own personal goal of what they'd like to achieve. The overarching uh, reason for it is they're trying to study women's bodies. So they're trying to figure out women specific, what kind of fuel do women need to participate in endurance sports? What happens to their heart rate when it's really warm or really cold at night when they're running? How much rest do women need? All of these women, of course, are at different places in their menstrual cycles or age. So how does menstrual cycle or where you are? Are you menopausal, perimenopausal, postmenopausal? How does that affect your athletic performance? The gear you're wearing, is it, you know, when they tailor things to women, you know, are they tailoring it to all different types of women's bodies? I just think, that, you know, I don't always love Lululemon. There have certainly been some controversies, you know, back in the day, the see-through pants and, oh, that's you know, right. the things with let's, and these are women, like you would look at some of them and say, wait, you're running the 20, 30 miles every day. And you don't quote, quote unquote look like a runner, but these women are, and it's just it's really it's a inc- pretty incredible um, challenge that they're taking. Well, I the thought also, but I, I thought part of the reason, maybe I'm wrong, was when we talk about is there a sport, is there an athletic activity in which women can beat men, men, and the feeling is that one possibility, not today, might be ultra long running yes, things, right? Yes, ultra long running is, a, is a, because of our fat storage, especially women who are childbearing age, there is a thought process that um, women tend to be better, more efficient, long distance, like ultra marathon runners, right? So if you're watching the, the US uh, you know, Olympic marathon trials or you're watching the Boston Marathon, men almost always are gonna finish 10, 15 minutes faster than the women. But in ultra marathons, where it's as much about about fueling and strategy as it is about speed, uh, they are finding that the times are closer and oftentimes women will beat men in those races. Well, you know, this woman who's yes, allegedly I know, leads, up, Camille, uh, Camille Heron, Heron. Alleg- uh, not allegedly, 42. Uh, apparently has the third 
most miles run in six days. Yes. And the only two people ahead of her are two men, but yes. she's in the top three ever. Supposedly. And she's run you know over what? five days. She's run 1,036 oh kilometers, and I don't know how long she does. It's but like 650 miles. or 700 yeah. miles. true, yeah. Ms. Marathoner, over there, that women marathoners can run faster at older ages, too, that you see women in their mid-30s, late-30s. Yeah, that's it's, great, again, too. Again, and they say, like, like, after you've, like, postpartum, after you've given birth, many women see huge jumps in performance. Really? Really? After they've What's given that birth. about? I think it's hormone. I think that's what this project is about. Like, let's figure out how to maximize women and not look at someone who gives birth and says, well, they're done, they're over, they're a mom. You know, how do you lose that baby weight? How do you take that hormonal changes, those musc all the things that happen when you give life into the world and how do you then parlay that into better athletic performance? I mean, again, anecdotal, and I'm not no, in no way, shape, or form an elite athlete, but all of my fastest marathon and half marathon times came between 37 and 41. Can I make one connection to a future guest at the end of the one, uh, late in the 12 o'clock hour, we're gonna have great filmmaker Mario Mazio with us. Remember oh, yeah. what her first film was? About a, Title A Nine. Hero for Daisy, was that what it was, it was called? About Title Nine. About Title Nine mm -hmm. at oh, Yale, yeah. which is where it all came about. Yeah. And obviously without that, none of this would have That yeah. enabled happened. women to yeah. have uh, uh, parity. Well, I don't know if we have parity. Move towards parity. Move towards, Move towards parity. parity. In, in any yeah. case, great to see you, Trini. Yeah, you too, guys. Thanks so much. And by the way, in all, in all mm -hmm. seriousness, We're getting some food here. congratulations. That Thanks. Really I'm, is really, I'm really, really, really excited. excited. Jim, yeah. wait till you turn yeah. around and see all the food that's I know, been brought I mean, in here. My food doesn't matter that much to me. It's just... Okay. We have been speaking with Trini Casey. She's an anchor and reporter for NBC. See Sports Boston coming up right after the new news. Media Maven and our favorite local woman, Sue O'Connell, who apparently has not only had run ins with coyotes, but also with moose. Did not know that. Learn something every day. She's going to talk about the lying, uh, cross wearing Alabama Senator Katie Britt and uh, her continuing travails. Uh, we'll see if she remains Trump's favorite senator to be his vice president. We'll see if that lasts. Anyway, you're listening to Boston Public Radio 89.7. GBH, we're broadcasting live from the Boston Public Library and streaming at youtube.com slash GBH News and facebook.com slash GBH News. Listening to Boston Public Radio with Jim Browdy and Marjorie Egan. Just ahead, more smart conversation about what's going on in our community. That's right after an NPR news break here on GBH News 89.7. Our programs are made possible thanks to you and BioNova Scientific, a biologics CDMO providing development and GMP manufacturing services to small and mid-sized biopharmaceutical companies. BioNova Scientific, where concept becomes cure. BioNovaScientific.org. New questions arise about Boeing's troubled 737 MAX jet two years after crashes that killed 346 people. Don't miss an updated Frontline Investigation, Boeing's Fatal Flaw. Tonight at 10 on GBH2. I'm Kirk Carapezzo with GBH's Higher Ed Desk, and you and I are listening to 89.7 WGBH, HD1 Boston, online at gbhnews.org. GBH News with NPR, what matters to you. I'm Jim Browdy, head on Boston Public Radio. First up in the noon hour, it's media maven and local woman, NBC10 Sue O'Connell, on motion in Washington to ban the Chinese-based social media monolith, TikTok. Then two giants of Boston's food scene, Tracy Chang and Jody Adams, both are leading international tasting tours, Tracy in northern Spain, Jody in Italy and across East Africa. They'll stop at the BPL first to talk to us. I'm Marjorie Egan. Then from 1 to 2, send us your texts, call us up, or come down in person to the Boston Public Library for the March edition of Ask the Mayor with Boston Mayor Michelle Wu. We'll talk about her plans to reshape Boston's housing law and address rising tides over East Boston, plus summertime street dining in the North End. Got your own question for the mayor? Call our text next, Boston Public Radio, 89.7 GBH.
live from NPR News in Washington. I'm Lakshmi Singh. Special Counsel Robert Hur is testifying before the House Judiciary Committee this hour about his investigation into President Biden's handling of classified documents. The need to show my work was especially strong here. The Attorney General had appointed me to investigate the actions of the Attorney General's boss, the sitting President of the United States. I knew that for my decision to be credible, I could not simply announce that I recommended no criminal charges and leave it at that. I needed to explain why. Her's report concluded criminal charges were not warranted, but it raised concerns about Biden's memory and recall abilities, an assessment that spurred swift condemnation from the White House as the 81-year-old Biden faces re-election. Many voters have raised concerns about Biden's age, as well as that of the GOP's presumptive nominee, Donald Trump, who turned 78 in June. There are several primary elections and a presidential caucus today. Republicans in Hawaii will hold their presidential caucus while voters in the Northern Mariana Islands, Washington State, Mississippi and Georgia hold primaries. One key race is in Georgia from member station WABE in Atlanta. Here's Sam Greenglass. About 415,000 Georgians have already cast ballots during early voting. The ballots were finalized a while ago, so the name of former South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley and others will still appear. Roy and Jenny Luke had been hoping to vote for Haley this fall and lament that Trump is poised to become the GOP nominee. He lost to Joe Biden once. So what makes us think he's going to win this time around? I would never, ever vote for Trump. So it would have to be Biden. Unlike his wife, Roy Luke says he'll ultimately have to vote for Trump. How independent-minded voters like the Lukes vote this fall could shape the outcome. For NPR News, I'm Sam Greenglass in Atlanta. The first major shipment of food aid by sea has set off from Cyprus for Gaza, where the U.N. says children are dying of malnutrition and wider famine is imminent. The charity World Central Kitchen says 200 tons of food loaded onto a barge will arrive in Gaza this week. NPR's Jana Raff has more from Amman. World Central Kitchen has been distributing meals in Gaza since the start of the war in October. But Israel, citing security concerns, has restricted aid going into Gaza by truck, the most efficient way to send it in. A Spanish aid organization, Open Arms, provided the vessel. The organization's spokesperson, Laura Lanuza, said they spent three weeks getting it ready, including Israeli scans of each box of food before it set off. Finally, we have been able to do it. As this is the beginning of this new humanitarian maritime corridor for Cyprus. She said assuming all goes well, there's more food waiting to be loaded as soon as this one returns. Jane Araf, NPR News, Amman. It's NPR News. Good afternoon with the latest from the GBH Newsroom. I'm Henry Santoro. Massachusetts Governor Maura Healey has formally appealed the Federal Emergency Management Agency's denial of her request for a major disaster declaration to aid in the ongoing recovery of local communities impacted by severe weather and flooding this past September. The letter was sent to President Biden and FEMA Regional Administrator Lori Ehrlich, who said, uh, says in part, quote, these storms were devastating for our communities. I saw the impacts firsthand. Homes and businesses were destroyed. Roadways and bridges were inaccessible and some residents had to be evacuated. Six months later, they're still rebuilding. The state has done all we can to support the recovery, but the needs far outpace our available resources, unquote. Those counties that were most affected by the storms were Worcester County, Hampton County, and Bristol County. Largest seafood expo in North America is packing up and leaving Boston today, and when it does, vendors will be donating thousands of pounds of fish to local food pantries. Tom Caravetta is Director of Operations at Food for Free, a food rescue nonprofit based in Somerville. Our volunteers will be sweeping the room, grabbing anything that's suitable to redistribute, and we'll be stacking boxes on pallets and then loading that into our trucks. Caravetta estimates they'll collect about 16,000 pounds of frozen and canned fish that will then be taken to the Cambridge Community Center, Harvard Square Meals, Grant, Ma- Grant Manor in Roxbury, and East Boston Harborside Community for distribution. This is GBH News. Support for NPR comes from NPR stations. Other contributors include Progressive Insurance with Snapshot, a personalized program that bases rates on safe driving habits at Progressive.com. Not available in California or from all agents. This is NPR.
Ladies to Rowdy, I am Marjorie Egan. Welcome to our number two of Boston Public Radio. We are broadcasting live from the Boston Public Library, as we do now every Tuesday, Wednesday, and Friday. And we are streaming at youtube.com slash GBH News and facebook.com slash GBH News. I want to remind people that from one to two today, the mayor of Boston, Michelle Wu, is going to be with us, taking our questions and yours from one to two. Hello again, Jim. I would like to say, before we introduce our next guest, I'm mm -hmm. told there's a gentleman sitting in the back of the room. That's right. Who is celebrating his 80th birthday, which is significant, but not as significant as what he did. I am told you pulled a tooth of mine. How was I as a patient? I was a coward, right? Thank you. Wonderful. Two thumbs up. Okay. He's lying, Wonderful. but it is his birthday. Congratulations. We're thrilled to have you here. 80th birthday is looking pretty good, too. We're joined now by local woman Sue O'Connell. Not only has encountered a coyote, but a moose, we are told. Oh, yeah. She is co-publisher of Bay Windows in the South End News, co-host of NBC 10's Boston at Issue, every Sunday at 11.30, following Meet the Press. And this Sunday, Sue and Colton Bradford, I'm so sorry, will host the St. <laughs> Patrick's Day. Oh, parade. Oh, parade. that's fine. Yeah. I thought you meant the breakfast. No. Forget the breakfast. No. Starting at 1 on NECN, that's great, NBC 10 Boston, or NBC 10 Boston streaming channel. Hello, Sue O'Connell. Good day to you. Good day to you. Hello, Thank Sue you. O'Connell. Thank you. Well, you know, there's a lot of talk now about uh, shutting down uh, TikTok, it's, uh, security concerns mm -hmm. involving China and stuff. Here's a little clip from former President Trump explaining. He's on a flip-flop. He used to be... Shocking. Um, he's reversed his position on TikTok anyway. He's talking to CNBC on the, about the ban. Frank, frankly, there are a lot of people on TikTok that love it. There are a lot of young kids Good on TikTok people on both who, sides, yeah. who will go crazy without it. There are a lot of uh, users. Uh, there's, you know, a lot of good, and there's a lot of bad. I can't listen. I, 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 I can't, I can't listen either. anymore. Okay, okay. So. Thank you. We, we think what happens is he doesn't like Mark Zuckerberg at Facebook, and he thinks it's going to help Facebook to get rid of TikTok, and apparently the big, a big uh, Republican donator is a mm -hmm. TikTok guy. Yeah, I mean, listen, there's a lot of good reasons to be concerned about TikTok, and a number of people I know who work in security, cybersecurity, government cybersecurity, don't have it on their phones. I don't have mine, uh, TikTok, on my phone either. Uh, and it's a great platform. People love it. It's a great way. Lots of young people and young adults are using it. And I think it's probably safe to say there is some national security concern here that we hope our lawmakers will serve. Donald Trump, actually, one of the things he tried to do while he was president was to, I think, basically do directionally the same thing that yes. the bill in front of Congress that is was doing, then, this is now. which is have them sell TikTok to an American owner and put a few barriers between the direct line of our data to the Chinese government. But now Donald Trump is talking gibberish once again, trying to change his mind, not making any sense, which we might as well just get used to until November. What's your position on this, by the way? Marjorie and I were going back and forth this morning off the air. Quickly, what, what, where are you on the Around band? the TikTok ban? Yeah. I think that we should stop calling it a ban because it's not really going to be a ban. I think it's going to be a TikTok with some guardrails on it. Um, it's difficult to do beyond my understanding on how mm. you would actually stop an app, but I think we should be concerned about all sorts of things that we have purchased in China, which are digital, which are taking our information and sending it right to okay, China. Okay, so Sue O'Connell, how long have you and I been friends? Oh boy, since the 90s. Okay, so like 30 years. Yeah. Now, Marjorie does not know this. Do you know what the moment was that our bond was solidified? <laughs> I do not know. About 20 years ago, do Sue not. and I were out yeah. having a drink okay. or something. I turned to her and I, you know what I said, remember what I said to you? I see you. <laughs> I hear you. I, whatever. Katie Britt, who is oh. literally the great, she is the gift that keeps on giving. So we know that Katie Britt, who is the Republican response to the State of the Union, totally humiliated herself. And you know what's sad about this, by the way? I've watched a lot of footage of her She's as a, a normal, normal person. person. She's a conservative, smart senator from Alabama. Could I don't be agree the with much. Of the Republican in party, any case, but I no. See you. But. The incredible oh. thing is, in addition to this pathetic, embarrassing performance, the centerpiece of her, of her testimony, of her speech, was about a woman who, well, tell the story, I, and it turns out the whole thing is a scam. Yeah, so, so the, the centerpiece of her story was that while Joe Biden was, is president, while we had this crisis on the border, a young woman uh, was trafficked in the United yes. States by sex traffickers. Terrible, right? Terrible thing. And she said, of course, it's like we're a third world nation. Well, it turns out she's been telling this story for a while. 
And uh, sadly, tragically, indeed, a woman was trafficked. But it didn't happen under Joe Biden's presidency. It happened under George W. Bush's pre presidency many, many years ago. The woman is an adult now. She said it happened to her when she was 12. And it didn't happen in the United States. It happened in Mexico. And um, this senator went and had a meeting with, uh, a, a panel meeting with this woman. She didn't even have a one-on-one -on -one no, meeting. And that was what meeting. she intimated. Yep, and, and she's an advocate for um, you know, sex traffic victims. And she used this as an example of how bad Joe Biden's policy has been on the border. And it's a complete, it's not even directionally correct, it's a complete fallacy. And again, using someone's pain to make a point, and I might add, you might think that this woman would seek asylum in the United States because of the terrible things that are happening to her and happened to her in Mexico. So it's, and, more importantly, she was sitting in front of her $10,000 refrigerator in her kitchen <laughs> trying to be relatable to the people who were watching at well, home. Well, you know what else she does now? And, and a lot of Republicans, women, do this. Uh, Laura Ingram does it all the time, who oh, the I think cross. is a big liar as far as I'm concerned. This woman obviously was lying through her teeth over and over again with a big cross around mm -hmm. her neck, which is supposed to be a symbol of Christianity. I think now it's become a symbol... I am lying because it seems as though people who <laughs> wear these crosses that's around their neck. Who said that. No. Yeah, well, I mean, you look at who's wearing these crosses right. and they tend not to be people that are telling the truth. She also had the trad wife voice, which the I don't who? know if the, what does the, that the mean? trad, the traditional wife, oh. which is yeah. this this movement of women, even if they're senators, who should be home cooking and be and they talk like this when they're doing their TikToks and Instagrams. But let me just say, if you're an elected official anywhere and your party comes to you and says would you like to do the response? The Don't do no. it. And do not <laughs> no do it. No is the answer. No, it's everybody no. almost. I mean, I can't think of one that was really good. I mean, I mean who is somebody who's drinking the water Joe all the time. Joe Biden during the Ronald Reagan administration. No, good? Joe Biden. Is that yes. true? He gave one, yes. I don't remember As that. a young office, senator? As a young senator in, in his that. office, he gave one, and that actually remember was Remember poor a good Congressman one. Joe Kennedy with the, the, the younger, with, yep. the, with the Vaseline. I think it was Vaseline. Yes, it was all over his lips. But at least he made a joke about it. He was on our show the next day and made a joke. He didn't lie. And you know the amazing part? of this and then we'll move on it isn't like there are a lot of horror stories that aren't true around the border and during joe biden right. that she could have told but the need was to do this and then by the way i hate the expression double down so i shouldn't use it then she doubled down right and said she really wasn't lying and by the way one last thing this is not just democrats criticizing her the woman about whom she was speaking has been saying this is totally untrue and she feels exploited by Brit having used her name and essentially and cooked the story. During the response, the Republicans were freaking out because it was clear how bad it was. I mean, it was um, the, the actor from Law & Order, which you know, Elliot Stabler, mm -hmm. who I watch repeatedly, he, he, he posted, this looks like my first audition tape that I made when I was 18, the overacting. Well, movie. you know what the proof is? She was funnier, Katie Britt, than Scarlett Johansson was yes. on Saturday Night Live doing Katie Britt. Yes. Yeah. We're talking to Sue O'Connell. So Sue O'Connell, uh, at our royal watcher here at Boston Public am. Radio, uh, big brouhaha about Kate Middleton. You didn't text me back Sunday night when I texted I you I did about text it. you back. Oh, I didn't get it back. I think I did. <laughs> I'll double check it, but I think I did. Say oh, something ridiculous like, oh my God, or something like that. But in any case, a big, big brouhaha yes. in front of all the tabloids over there in Great Britain and the royal watcher. I love these royal watchers. They always got these great British accents. I'd like to have that for a job. That's what their careers are royal watchers. There's yeah. dozens of them. But in any case, she has been uh, she's been sidelined since Christmas time mm -hmm. with this unknown abdominal surgery. We haven't seen her, and she posts this picture on the British Mother's Day. Of we, allegedly, her, she posted it. She allegedly, said she posted it. Allegedly, that's she's, right. Yes. With her and her three kids, but it was not. She said she doctored it. Allegedly, she said she doctored it. What do you think is going on here? Oh gosh. Well, I just want to put a warning out to folks because as much as there's a lot of you know British tea here, we want to spill. Um, Associated Press and Reuters, who know what they're doing, got this photo from the palace, which is an official organization, official government organization, and they took it at face value and they published it and then did a kill order, which sometimes happens when they don't have authorization for a photo or they're not sure of it. I think it's the first official photo from a government organization that got a kill order because they realized it was wrong. So as we- Pretty, pretty discreet. You didn't really look at it a long well, time. Well, it also was creepy. Yeah. I mean, I saw it first and I went, what a creepy picture because if even the professional kids in professional photos, you can't get three kids to look that happy at yeah. once. It's just if they're totally, royal, you can. No, I don't even think even with a taser you can get them to look that, that happy as I've tried at home. <laughs> um, and 
<laughs> so it gave me the creeps, and then people looked at it and saw, you know, you didn't need a degree in Photoshop or AI to see that there was just this, this cut and paste that was happening. So if, my point is, if Associated Press and Reuters were fooled, then we are really, to our point that we talk about a lot, we need to be really vigilant during this election season. Oh, it's hopeless. Um, the AI about stuff what is we're hopeless. watching, you know, there was... Uh, See uh, the photograph of Trump surrounded by black, black people, voters? Which was, it Obviously totally, totally all cooked. made up. The, the Joe Biden robocall that happened in New Hampshire yeah, sure. with yeah. the AI uh, voice of Joe Biden saying don't vote. So I'm just, you know, using our royal fascination to say we just need to be like super duper vigilant okay. when it comes to all Okay, one of these. last thing about this though. I always mock you and Marjorie and uh, Callie's into this too. This <laughs> royal crap I don't get. So the reason we pretend we care about this so we're not embarrassed is because she had an operation at the end of last year She's and missing. she hasn't been seen yes. and so she, that's the alleged we reason that we're so concerned. We don't know what the medical issue is. How do you think Queen Elizabeth feels in heaven? She's been holding this family together I know. for it's centuries. One thing after centuries. Okay. and it's falling All right. apart. And Can she, we do I don't think she ever had any operations in her life. Nobody cares about this. Nobody cares. Does anybody care, care. 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 care about her cooking the photograph other than those yes, two? Do. Raise your hand if you care. I'm concerned about taking names. Nobody. They're too embarrassed. Are taking names. That's blame. right. Can we break? Poor you know, Kate. we have discussed. We're going to end with something really serious and really troubling. We have talked a lot about the cruelty and the sadism of people like uh, Governor DeSantis, mm -hmm. Governor Abbott, who essentially have decided the culture wars, which is a euphemism, which and the the reality of the euphemism is beat up on the most vulnerable people in society: trans kids, LGBTQ people, etc. And I assume there are a few people who may have been holdouts on the issue, until this report comes out, that in states with laws targeting LGBTQ people, school hate crimes have quadrupled. Let me repeat, four times as great as in places that do not have this kind of sadistic legislation. So, okay. Right, a uh, story in the Washington Post today uh, talking about it. And not only have the hate crimes quadrupled, but the LGBTQ hotlines are being overwhelmed with calls for protections and information. And, you know, this is one of those basic things. It's whenever, I, I hate to say the, the wokeness and how people accuse people of being woke, the way that you model your behavior as a government, as teachers, as an institution, as parents, your kids are always watching you and they are always taking cues as to how to behave. And if you can't extend the common decency to just ignore how someone is, you don't have to support it, you don't have to advocate for them, but if you can't politely ignore how someone is, your kids are gonna pay attention to that. And if the kids know that they can do things to other students and get away with it. Yeah. And kids are kids. I mean, you know, I, I, I'm not going to, you know, blame an 11 year old for um, engaging in a behavior that is harmful to another 11 year old. But you know that if you allow it to happen, more kids will do it. So all of this anti LGBTQ legislation and rhetoric and behaviors by adults is trickling down to the children. And I fear that the decades of progress that we have made in just, again, just accepting and tolerating, which I know we used to hate to use the word tolerating, mm -hmm. but I would, I would, you know, go back to having a little tolerance when it comes to some of the things that are happening in these red states that are not just targeting adults, but it trickles down and it ends up targeting kids. The only uh, uh, heartening thing I read after I read about this was, was a story, I think, in the Washington Post over the weekend that said Florida voters being enamored of the culture war crap from DeSantis are getting tired yeah. of it. It's not as popular, so hopefully he disappears and the hate that he spews disappears. Hey, one him. quick question before you go. A texter's saying that the voice we're talking about with Katie Britt is called the Fundy Baby Voice. That's also, I don't know yes, that Mike means. Johnson's the wife fundamental speaks that. Baby. Mike, yeah. oh, is that Mike it? Johnson's she wife speaks like that. Oh, and she does? The, the, the wife of Mike, yeah, Mike and, Johnson. And Katie the family Britt. with the five billion kids, the Dugers. Oh, they speak she like that like too. She talks like that too. Okay, they talk yes, like it's the way they all talk. How does Kate Middleton talk? I've never heard her talk. Fundy Baby Voice. How does she talk? No, she doesn't. How does she talk? You know? Yeah, I need to do that in the radio. Excuse me, Bart. How do you? Okay, fine. Do you have any idea how she talks? Jim, I believe she speaks like oh, this. That's good. She would not that speak to very, you very directly you because it would be below her to discuss anything with okay, you. Okay, you have 30 okay. seconds. What was your moose encounter? Really quickly. So, my dad, uh, if you saw The Irishman, the movie, oh, yes. indeed. Yes. That was my dad. Robert De Niro played my dad, basically. Born in 1918, World War II vet, teamster, truck driver, tough as nails, got in fights all the time. We were up in Maine when I was about four, 
he was out on the back deck of our little cabin smoking a filterless camel <laughs> cigarette, holding a light beer or a Schlitz, and I walked out to get him, and he was the most frightened. I have, I've never saw him afraid in my entire life, and he was white as a ghost, and there was a huge moose just standing there like inches well, away from good. his face. Oh, my God. And I remember I was so horrified and terrified that my dad was afraid because I'd never, ever seen him afraid, and he scooped me up, and we ran in, locked the door, and then he said some really terrible words. <laughs> <laughs> wow. They are aggressive, I guess. And Going they're big. I did a rod dog. Yeah, they're, they're big. huge, like horses. Yeah, I mean, everyone... No, huge. Oh, they're bigger. huge. They're bigger. Are they bigger than horses? Huge. They're really bigger. high up and really... Yeah, I mean, I know okay. I was only like three or four. Well, we got the big. concept. I hope I never see Sue him. Sue is Local wonderful. Local woman encounters moose. Exactly. I changed the narrative, finally. Local woman <laughs> Sue O'Connell. Let's hear for our dear friend okay. Sue. We've been speaking with local woman and animal enthusiast <laughs> Sue O'Connell, co-publisher of Bay Windows and South End News, co-host of NBC10 Boston's At Issue, which you can see every Sunday at 11.30 following Meet the Press. This Sunday, Sue and Colton Brather will host the St. Patrick's Day Parade, as Jim just said, starting at 1 o'clock on NEC, and that's NBC10Boston.com or NBC10 Boston streaming channels. Sue O'Connell, thanks a lot. Up next... Two local chefs are bringing Boston foodies all over the world from northern Spain to Tanzania and talking to them about uh, food. We're going to find out what these exotic locales mean to these chefs and possibly to you if you want to take one of these trips. Jody Adams and Tracy Chang are next. You're listening to Boston Public Radio 89.7 GBH. I'm Jared Bowen. Coming up on The Culture Show, playwright Connor McPherson used Bob Dylan's songbook to create the Broadway hit Girl from the North Country, now on stage in Boston. It's neither a jukebox musical nor a biographical musical, even though it's set in Dylan's hometown. We talked to McPherson about his deep connection to Bob Dylan's music and what it took to make this one-of-a-kind show. That's on The Culture Show today at 2 on 89.7 GBH. Support for our programs comes from you. And Finn Partners, a marketing and communications agency dedicated to creating deeper relationships between brands and people in Boston and 34 other locations worldwide. More information at finnpartners.com. And McLean Middleton, a regional law firm with over 100 attorneys and locations in Woburn and Boston, serving clients for over 100 years in the areas of corporate law, tax law, litigation, and estate planning. McLean.com. Welcome back to Boston Public Radio. We're live at the library, streaming on youtube.com slash GBH News, facebook.com slash GBH News. And at 1 o'clock today, 36 minutes from now, Mayor Wu will join us for an hour of Ask the Mayor. She'll take our questions and yours. And uh, that's a pretty great photo of Jody Adams and Tracy Chang. We'll get to them in a minute. And by the way, if you're at the library, that little mic over there is one where if you go to one of our coworkers, you can ask the mayor a question face to face. Uh, is that right, Jim? Yes, it is. Yes. You know, we talk a lot on the show about the fabulous restaurants in our backyard. We're going to do that in a couple of seconds, too. But today, we're also going to focus on the food experiences as far away from Boston as you can get while still in the company of the city's foremost food authorities. Here with us now at the interview desk, Tracy Chang, the multi-James Beard-nominated woman behind Pagu in Cambridge and co-founder of, founder of Project Restorus. Good to see you, Tracy. How are, okay. you? How are you? And, and uh, can I call you, you don't like being called a legend because you're humble. You can call me a legend. Okay, another <laughs> legend of Boston's food scene. She just said it was fine. James Beard winning Jody Adams, co-founder and chef at restaurants like Porto, Trade, Saloniki, and the soon-to-be open uh, La Padrona is also co-founder of the Hospitality Coalition Mass Restaurants United. The thread between these two women today are the international food tours they're offering. For Jody, she'll be biking across northern Italy this June with a group, then traveling across East Africa next year. For Tracy, they're calling it the gastronomic adventure of a lifetime across northern Spain this September. 
And apparently there's room for you. We'll tell you about it in a minute. Tracy, Jody, great to see you both. Thanks so much for being so here. So good to yeah, be here. Yeah, thank you very much. And thank you for these wonderful treats. I'm very excited we'll about them. We'll get to those. We'll get to those in a second. But let's start with you, the legendary Jody Adams. What are these trips about? You, you, you travel with, with groups of people and then you talk about, how does it work? Well, I want to go on Tracy's trip. Tracy's <laughs> <laughs> So don't sell out before the end of the show. I started doing these in 2006. Try to move your mic down about a half an inch, an inch. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you. I was invited to lead a tour in Sicily. And oh. I'd never really done that before, and I thought, why not? And then somebody said, you know, it's hilly in Sicily. <laughs> um, and it was amazing because you ride through orange groves and you see people, you know, harvesting artichokes and you get to actually go into farm kitchens and cook. and then you get to eat a lot, and you get to drink a lot, and you get to know the people on the, on the trip. So that was the first, and I've been doing them. That was in 2006 or so, and I've been doing them ever since. So this one is to Piedmont, which is in northwestern Italy, and it is Piedmont, Mont being mountain. So it is mountainous. Um, and but you're a big biker. I'm a big biker because, you know, it was sort of like you give a mouse a cookie. I started cycling. I got a really good bike, a seven that are made in Watertown, a custom-made bike, which is amazing. And then I had to ride the Pan Mass Challenge. The great so Pan Mass Challenge. This is the 14th year coming up this year. We have a big wow. team. Do you do two days? I do two days. Wow, that's wow. pretty impressive. Yeah. They've raised only a billion dollars, by the way. They go from for here Dana to, Farber. Is it to Provincetown? Yeah. From Sturbridge. From Sturbridge. So wait a second, back oh to the tour. God. So at the stops when people are eating, what do you do? Talk with the local chefs? It, well, it depends. We'll, we'll go into a restaurant or we'll go to, into a home kitchen and cook or somebody will demonstrate oh. a particular pasta or something like that. And then there are organized uh, dinners where, or lunches where I cook. There are a couple of those who are cook, and people can participate if they want to. Some people would rather sit back and uh, have a little wine, but uh, watch everybody else cook. But it's, it's amazing. It's an amazing experience to see a country on the ground. The, the reality is, though, you can only see a certain portion of it because if you do 30 miles in a day, you yeah. don't go very far. I just want to make one note, and then I'll... Um, electric bikes are big. So anybody who's interested um, in a trip like this Electric bikes have become something that's very much available, and so everybody can ride. And the one I'm doing is at the end of June, um, June 23rd, for a week, and there's still some spots. We're going to give you the website before you go if you'd like to join Jody and friends. Similar thing for you in Spain, Tracy Chang? Um, so I'm kind of going home. Home away from home uh, is Spain for me. So I lived in San Sebastian uh, back in 2011. I worked with Three Star Michelin Martin Brasategui. Um, and since opening my restaurant now, seven years ago, I've always had folks who come, they love the food, they love the atmosphere, and they're like, we want to go to Spain with you. Uh, and so last year, we found ways to do that. Um, my, one of my best friends in San Sebastian happens uh, to have lived there for the last 30 years, and she runs a really boutique um, kind of tour guiding food and wine experience. And so we said, why don't we team up and do this? We've always wanted to, and now let's do it. And so last year, we led two groups out there. Um, and this year, we'll be leading two more groups. And more so, it just kind of comes from the organic kind of growth of, of people being interested. And what do you do? Do you um, cook? you do classes? What do you do as part of the whole deal? Yeah. Um, people get to hang out with me, whether that's fun or not. You're stuck <laughs> with me the whole time. Um, so uh, last time, I gave two cooking classes. Um, I led Pinchos tours. Uh, we do walking tours as well. If people want to have some free time to do some cycling or go go to the beach or go surfing, that's also an option. It's a good mix of, you know, programmed and also free time. And how many yeah. people, I, it, start with you, Tracy, how many people get to get and do this with you? Yeah, so last year's trip, which we co-led with Old Ways, um, it was, we were told it was going to be 20, and then uh, it oversold and it became 45. Oh my God. Wow. 45, that's a <laughs> big crowd. Yeah. I, that would be exhausting. How about you, Jody? 14. 14. <laughs> 14. Yeah, that's more 14 manageable. To 20. That's a good size. Yeah. That's what, we're, what we aim for, like yeah. 14 to 20, an intimate yeah. group. You know, yeah. Tracy, while you, you mentioned you're going to do some courses there, there, I heard a rumor that a legendary radio talk show host <laughs> took a course at your restaurant and lo pulling, pulled noodles, long noodles. Yeah, I don't know. Who was it and guy, how was he? This tall guy in the yeah. room, Jim Browdy, maybe. And how did he do? <laughs> he did a great job. How, okay. many, how many noodles did you get? 
out of your thing, the right you amount? So I actually did. did. I, I did Thousands? Not, I'm usually in cooking classes, I'm usually last. And Tracy was kind enough to say I wasn't the worst. Is that no, a fair? No, not the worst. I, not the oh, worst. thank you. That's yeah. a hell of an endorsement. No, he's, he's, he's become quite the cook, you know. Well, whatever. He, he arrives, at, or, not today because we're at the library, but in the studio with little Tupperware jars. Oh, uh, that's very nice. Cooked. So can we talk about food? Uh, yes, we mentioned yes. all of your great places. What did you bring with you that we're so going to sample? So I brought food from Saloniki. Love we, Saloniki. We uh, have five Saloniki, two new ones that open, one on Newbury, one on Beacon, and then, of course, Harvard Square, MIT, and one near Fenway. Greek for those first, th people that don't Greek. know, yeah. And it's a fast, casual Greek restaurant, food from scratch, delicious, with my partners, John and Eric Papa Christos, who's the Greek in the group. Understood. Um, and I've brought all kinds of things, lamb meatballs, oh, zucchini fritters. Where the hell are the lamb meatballs? Over on this side. You've got the Spanish side of things. This I would Greek like to side. We can check do a out a lamb crossover. meatball, if you don't mind, while you're talking. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Maple so, thank meatballs. you. Could you pass that to me, Tracy? Please, thank you. And Lamb meatball, yes. salad and, and baklava and yogurt and all kinds of stuff. What's a, La Padrona? We, we had Chris from Muther here talking about the Raffle, Raffles mm. Hotel, which he, I think he said is maybe the only perfectly scored hotel. He's, he's a travel writer yeah. from Globe he's ever been to. What's the status of your restaurant there? Almost. <laughs> almost? <laughs> We're vibrating with excitement about getting it open. Yeah, it's almost open. It's ready. Amaryllis, our chef, is here Hi uh, there, cheering. welcome. Glad yeah. to see you. And uh, she's got the menus ready. David is also here, who is in charge of our beverage program. Hi, David. And um, the wine list, the cocktail list, everything's ready to go. We just need to get everything plugged in. Why do you in. keep expanding, by yeah. the way? Why do you or decide? Or why do you also, why do you shut down? I mean, I'm always curious why, because you, you've had so many restaurants. You've had Rialto that was over there in Cambridge, Trade, uh, Porto, all those places. But Rialto, I was so disappointed when I found it shut down. How do you decide that? Is it because you're sick of it? You just want to try something different creatively, creatively or what? There's so many factors that yeah. play into something like that. That, that, that would be a whole other show that Good. probably couldn't be public. So, um, <laughs> How about the expansion? Let's do positive. How do you decide? Yeah, let's I do mean, look, positive. How okay. do you deal with the stress? Why do you do that? I mean, you have unbelievable places. Why do you do that? I have these great partners who are 20 and 30 years younger than I am. And they are really uh, visionaries and have so much ambition. And we have so many great people in our company who are pushing to advance. And uh, so we open it for David and Amaryllis. That's it. You That's know, good that, enough. By the way, I've had the lamb meatballs at Saloniki about a thousand times. They are fabulous. And the spice thing is just unbelievable. So, but just to get back, Raffles oh, is like a, an amazing hotel. If you haven't been yet, it's just a couple blocks away. It's the first Raffles hotel in the Americas. No. Started in Singapore in the 1900s or something like that. It's a very cool and beautiful spot. And we yeah. feel incredibly fortunate to be in the space, it's going to be two floors, first and second floor, oh and Italian and delicious. And we and had beautiful. Christopher Muther on Just describing so, yeah. this hotel, which sounds like nothing I've ever experienced in my whole life with the level of service and the level of detail. Oh, right, he had the and butler the, woman in his room, right? That woman yeah. whose name I can't remember yes. in his story was making a drink and for him. And the flowers, I mean, you walk in flowers. In, you walk, it's, it's a narrow, a tall, narrow hotel. So uh, the lobby is not expansive, but it's. I just want to live there. The <laughs> exactly. flowers are amazing. Okay. The people are beautiful. I ate at your restaurant Saturday night at Tracy Chang. Uh, what did you? It was spectacular, I should say. What, you. what did you bring uh, with you? Yeah, so we wanted to transport you to Spain for, for lunch today. So we have a traditional tortilla española, uh, some uh, jamón ibérico here. So what is that? Happy pigs that have been feasting on acorns and then chilling in the shade, and then they get aged... Uh, over 48 months. <laughs> and, and so wow. what do you do what do you wow. do with what is this? Is this prosciutto? What is that? No, it's better than prosciutto. What is you it? Can't call it it's Sorry. jamon, it's jamon. Oh, hum, oh, okay. And what do you do? Do you eat a bite of this with a bite of that? You can eat it however you like. Okay, thank it's, you very much. Yeah. What does that mean? Hum, what does that word mean? Hamon? Ham. Yes. Ham. Oh, ham. ham. Ham, okay. Ham. I'm really bilingual and multilingual, <laughs> you know, as you can tell. Well, I'm, I'm sorry, go ahead, you go ahead. I was going to talk about the fact that you know we, we ha have talk about the restaurant business all the time, and I'm always struck by how uh, people in the restaurant business are oh so God. worried about and kind to the whole future of the restaurant business. I mean, you're both activists. Uh, you do this thing, what's it called? The Mass Restaurants United, Jody. What's that about? Well, um, just about four years ago, right? March 10th. COVID. We all looked at each other in the business and said, what are we going to do? The governor has just told us to shut down. And we have all these people that work for us and need jobs and food and they have to take care of their families and 
we have food in the walk-in that's going to rot, and um, oh, yeah. we have to pay our rent. I mean, just there were so many unknowns, and plus we had to wear masks and, you know, like bathe ourselves as we walked in and out. It was it was a really scary time, not just because of the you know because of COVID, but because of what was happening. And Tracy did an amazing job with her restaurant of completely transforming it. We didn't quite do that at Porto. We did a lot of to-go. Um, we closed down trade. We had one Saloniki open for a long time, but Tracy really did an amazing job. But what we did collectively and the business was start something called Massachusetts Restaurants United, which was to represent independent small restaurateurs who were facing the crisis and provide a voice and advocate for that community of people. And there was a larger organization, IRC, as you probably remember, that went on, but... Um, we had Tony Maws on. Were you with him that day? I can't yes. remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, Zoom. Was, and, and so, how are independent restaurants doing on the other end of this nightmare? I think some are still, you know, recovering financially. Some did not survive because of the financial burden. Um, some are thriving. Uh, you know, I think it... I think it's a mix of both, yeah. I, I think that, um, you know, for a lot of small businesses, you still see places closing, um, you know, in our neighborhood in Central Square. Um, How'd you make it? How? Yeah, how? Uh, we kept reinventing. Um, we kept reinventing ourselves uh, because we couldn't just survive on, on takeout alone. So we had started off their plate before the, uh, the governor made their announcement. So that was um, empowering other restaurants as well to deliver food to community health centers, hospitals, et cetera. That's how Jody and I um, partnered up during, uh, during COVID as well as Joan Chang and many other, you know, Ken Oranger, many other uh, chefs um, uh, in, in Boston area, as well as many, you know, small biz uh, woman owned BIPOC chefs that you know you might not have heard of because they don't get a lot of screen time, they don't get a lot of air time. And what's Project um, Restore Us? You set up two things during yeah. COVID. And Project Restore Us kind of spun out of that. We started in May 2020 and we realized that there's this you know, a huge need for um, food, for these food insecure families. Um, and this was existing pre-COVID, but it was going to be even worse during COVID and after COVID. And so Project Restore Us continues now. Um, and what we do is we have uh, restaurants during COVID, we had restaurants package culturally appropriate groceries, and we had volunteer drivers deliver those door to door to food Incredible. insecure families. And now what we're doing is empowering local youth, working with the Moses Youth Center in Cambridge, and teaching the youth how do we do that from a logistics standpoint, how do you make recipes so that the families feel engaged and they know what to do with the products, and now that is even more lasting. That lasts them four to six weeks. And so there's, um, you know, you kind of break that circuit of food insecurity because you're empowering the youth to really take part and take action That's in fabulous. it. You know, Jody introduced both her lead chef and her beverage person. You should mention uh, some young people you brought along with you who are, several of whom are gonna be on our show in a few months. Who are they? Yeah, I got Sergio, David, uh, Javier, Mateo, and they're all here from the Basque Culinary Center, and they'll be at Pagu Great. with us for the next six months, and we'll be working on things like this Project Re uh, Restore Us collaboration with the Mozu Center. We'll be doing pop-ups like these tapas and all kinds of fun stuff. What's the cake before Marjorie asks her question? Cheesecake with? Yeah, burnt Basque cheesecake oh my God. with Maine blueberry sauce. Thank you. Yep. you know, th this is, this is a customer question, because I've noticed, we've talked a lot, you know, before the pandemic, during the pandemic, after the wow. pandemic, about how wages need to be upped in restaurants and how the front of the house should be more equal to the back of the house, that kind of thing. And I've noticed when I do go out, you're a big restaurant guy, that you get, oftentimes, get the 18% um, add-on service fee. So what are you supposed to tip? You were debating. <laughs> well, we were you debating You asked this of Corby a couple yes, of weeks I did. ago. Go ahead. And, and I'm not sure. If there's already an 80% add-on, you want to you wanna give somebody a, a 20 or 25% tip, or sometimes people even go 30. You're supposed to add it on to the 18, or what's the correct thing, Jody? I, I, you have to ask your heart, I think. You know, really turn to your heart. This is a very complicated, evolving question. Yeah. Um, on so many fronts, um, we're being asked to tip. And this grew out of, I mean, it was already there, but it's really sort of expanded during COVID. I think you evaluate, I, 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 what is the percentage that you think is appropriate to tip? Is right. it, do you typically tip 25%, then up it to 25%? Okay. I don't think you need to, to then tip in again 20%. That's the whole point of, we're supposed to be thinking about eliminating the tip so that there's 
equity in the way that we um, are, are paying people, the way we perceive people, the way we value people. It's, but it's so complicated. She, so she you, said, check your heart, Marjorie, check your heart. is what Jody so if said. You check are, your if you heart. consider yourself a good tipper, that you might leave 25%. So if you get the 18 there, you'd add 7. Is Very that what you're supposed to do? There's not a supposed to. There's not a supposed not to. We're not okay. telling well, you what to do. You're not supposed to. You're not supposed to tip under 20, right? <laughs> you're not yeah, supposed you're not to tip under 20. That's right. That's right. But, but I think it's confusing to many people because it's sort of a new thing, and I think people are confused. Can I tell you something before? You guys don't get to listen to the show every day. When the guys from this old house are on, she pretends she's asking questions for other people about ice dams. This is for Marjorie. <laughs> Excuse she's me. She's guilt-ridden Excuse about me. tipping. The so person... She's talking- I was having dinner with at this particular time that took the check was you, Mr. Brown. Whatever. He's a good tipper. Here's what I would say. He is a good tipper. Yes, Jody. To everybody who tips. Nobody who is being tipped is getting rich. No, they're not. And if you give an additional $5, $2, you will walk away from that encounter feeling so wonderful in your day and it will make a huge difference to somebody else. Right. So you're going to make the world a better place if you give a little bit more, and you're not going to hurt anybody. Nobody take, is taking advantage of you. You know, you're not killing the system. Just give. Search you your go. heart, Mark. What would you say? What was the verb you used? What did you do to your Search heart? Search your heart. I think Search your it. heart? I like that. Hey, uh, uh, what else? Could you just say before you go, what else is, did you bring? So, so we, I have Bach here. You're a sweet guy, right? I am. Baklava. Ooh. Big tipper. Crisps. Big Thank tipper. Thank you. I am a fairly good And tipper. we I have uh, yogurts. Uh, Ooh. The, I love the those. Fig, They're you're, great. You're a lemon person, right? Thank I certainly <laughs> am. Yeah. Thank you very much. Fig or gin. I'm a oh fig kind of person. There you go. Thank you, Jody. So those Appreciate are the sweets, and then oh, we have some more savory things. This is wonderful. So Thank it's you, great guys. to see you both, by yeah. the way. And we're going to give websites if you want to travel to this year. To Africa. To Africa. Yeah, we didn't talk about Tanzania. 2020. East 2020. Africa, right? East Africa. Tanzania and to Rwanda. So it will be a safari plus the gorillas, which is unbelievable to experience the gorillas. You're going to be, have you been in Africa? Yes, I've been on, this will be my fifth safari. Oh my God. And we cook, we cook with the cooks at the camp. We end up at Gibbs Farm, which has an amazing garden. It's, a, it's an amazing experience. And you so. land at the Kilimanjaro Airport, I yeah. read. And then we do wow. little putter jumps in planes, and you climb up, and the gorillas are... The silverbacks, if you've never been in the presence of a silverback, I mean, it's a huge privilege to do it. It is. You just want to stay with him. It's like, hey, Dad, <laughs> Dad. That's 2025. 25. And the uh, gastronomic adventure of a lifetime is across northern Spain this September. That's with Tracy. That Thank will be amazing. Well, and with come. these, are, are they going to? Yeah, it should come. No, okay. no, no, you're, you're, you'd your be good. Okay. You would be good on one of these. Jim would. Jim Can I just say before they go, they don't, they're not only great chefs and restaurateurs and entrepreneurs, they are great leaders in our community. Both of you are just spectacular. Thank and we're you. thrilled to have you today. Thanks to be so thank, you thank, you thank you very, very much for being here. Okay, we've been speaking with great chefs, Jody Adams and Tracy Chang, won all sorts of awards, both of them. Uh, for Jody's tour through Italy this June, you go to Terissimo Travel. That's T-O-U-R-I-S-S-I-M-O. Terissimo Travel for a taste of Africa experience, May 2025. Go to thompsonsafaris.com. And for Tracy's trip to Spain, coming this September, the website is tenedortours.com. That's T-E-N-E-D-O-R, tenedortours.com. Josie, uh, Jody and Tracy, thank you and so much. And thanks for the great and food, and Thank too. you for all this food. Thank you so much. Believe me, we are really excited about this. <laughs> <laughs> no question about See it. See you guys soon. Okay, coming up, up after a quick break, we're going to talk with filmmaker Mary Mazio about Bad River, her latest documentary detailing the Bad River Band of Lake Superior's ongoing fight for sovereignty, their fight to protect the lake from the Enbridge Line pipeline and devastating pollution and a ruination of their land. You are listening to Boston Public Radio 89.7 GBH. We are broadcasting live from the Boston Public Library, streaming on youtube.com slash GBH News and facebook.com slash GBH News. The mayor of Boston will be here for taking our calls and yours at 1 o'clock. Flint, Michigan, has one of the country's highest rates of child poverty. Now, a new program will give money to all new moms there during the first year of their baby's lives so they don't have to choose between basic needs. Are the lights going to be on versus diapers and things that she may need? I'm Mary Louise Kelly. Program leaders hope this will lead to healthier babies. More on All Things Considered from NPR News. Today at 4, here on GBH News 89.7. 
Support for GBH comes from you. And H&H, the Handel and Haydn Society. Maestro Raphael Pichon returns to lead a fervently fresh take on Beethoven's magnum opus, his Ninth Symphony. March 15th and 16th at Symphony Hall, handelandhaydn.org. And the trustees. You can ring in spring at Nomkeg in Stockbridge with the annual Daffodil and Tulip Festival. Colorful seasonal blooms April 19th through Mother's Day. Advanced tickets required. More at thetrustees.org slash spring. Welcome back to Boston Public Radio. Jim Brady and Marjorie Egan. We're live at the library. The mayor joins us in about 15 minutes for Ask the Mayor. We're joined now in person at the BPL by award-winning filmmaker Mary Mazio, a legendary U.S. rower in the 92 Olympics. Her first film, as I mentioned earlier in the show, 1999's A Hero for Daisy, tells the story of the early days of Title IX. Her latest is a spectacular documentary. It's called Bad River. On the Bad River tribe's ongoing fight for sovereignty, and their fight to protect Lake Superior from a potential oil spill from the Enbridge. We all know Enbridge locally, Local 5 oil pipeline. Here's a clip from the trailer. When the meander reaches the pipeline, apocalyptic. If it breaks, you know, this is going to pour right into Lake Superior. And that's bad. It is the grandmother of the Great Lakes. It is the freshwater stronghold of planet Earth. Trying to shut down a pipeline, that's a major endeavor. It's a David and Goliath type of situation, right? You gotta stop it. It is David Goliath type of situation. Uh, our monthly guest and legendary environmentalist Bill McKibben calls the film, quote, a powerful chronicle of some of the saddest chapters in American history and a hopeful picture of the emerging possibilities for power in the crucial fights of our time. It's premiering on Friday in select theaters, including at AMC Boston Common 19. More information at badriverfilm.com. Mary, it's great to see you. Congratulations. Oh, my friend, yeah. it's great to see you, Marjorie. You yeah, it is great to see you, too. Oh, it has it's been, been way while. too long. It and has. hello, Boston. What a setup you have here. Look at these amazing yes, people. It's gorgeous. It's yeah, it's gorgeous. But, you know, congratulations uh, on this film. It was so inspiring, and it's fun to myself. Uh, these people, these Native Americans that you spoke with, I mean, they have such a wonderfully countercultural ethos. It was so refreshing. But tell people what the film's about. So, um, Bad River, which comes to AMC Boston Common, be there, be square. Uh, we open up in 10, 12 cities, actually, on Friday. And it's about this remarkable community that uh, their ancestral homelands are on the shores of Lake Superior. And they have been battling for hundreds of years to protect Lake Superior. And now the newest chapter of a very, very old story is with a Canadian pipeline operator whose rights ran out to operate over a quarter of the you know, pipeline corridor about 10 years ago. And the pipeline operator has continued to stay irrespective. And now the pipeline is actually at risk of rupture where the Bad River, the Bad River turns into Lake Superior and she's making a carve. She is meandering, as they will say, um, and she's headed straight for the pipeline. And when that happens, both sides have agreed, which could be as soon as the next flood, then Lake Superior hangs in the balance. And Marjorie, you said something about communal. Yeah. And what I noticed is here is this historically neglected group fighting so hard at great personal cost, turning down the latest open letter from the pipeline operator offered them $80 million to settle the lawsuit. And um, the former chairman, <laughs> former chairman said, what we were doing here on the Bad River Reservation by protecting and fighting so hard to protect Lake Superior, it is the freshwater stronghold for America. Yes. It is the largest freshwater by area source in the world. And he said something to me, he said, what we're doing is our patriotic duty. And the current chairman said, you know, our treaty rights and, and our obligations um, uh, cannot be purchased with money. So, yeah. it's, so, so, so talking about that. It wasn't about, about money. I it know. was so unusual. <laughs> and, you know, I have to say, you know, when I first showed up, um, I'm sort of your tip, like you guys, right? We got food, we got goodies, and typically go west young person, you yeah. know, a rugged individualist. And, and the chairman's taking me on the tour of the Bad River in Lake Superior, and we pull up to a beautiful beach, and I see a shiny rock. Okay, what do you think I do? Pick it up, put it in your pocket. I went, oh, <laughs> I will conquer. Like, that will be mine. 
And I'm like, literally, I'm, uh, it was one of those moments where the chairman looked at me and I'm already like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm mid grab. And I thought, you know, here's a perfect example of a non-native faux pas. Um, and what I was sort of mortified by myself. Are we profanity free here, by the way? We yes, are we profanity are. Profanity free. Yeah, well, yeah. I was like, oh, yeah, I just did that. And long story short, the chairman was so kind and he looked at it and he said, you know, we have concretions that are like indigenous to this, to, to where we are right here. They're sacred that we call them grandfather rocks. He said, let me see what's in your hand. Oh, I'm How humiliating. Oh my I know. God. Oh. And so I opened it and he said, rocks. and he, I could see this relief. And he said, okay, no, this is something else. He said, I said, please let me put it back. He said, no, I'm going to put down some tobacco. And he put down some tobacco and he said, now you can take it. And I thought, oh, you know, it was one of the early lessons in terms of it's not about grabby me, you know, it's not about what I want. And for this small community to, with unbelievable monumental effort, turn down this kind of money to preserve Lake Superior for all of us, like that's extraordinary. I mean, to say a couple things. One, by the way, when we mention Enbridge, if people say, I know Enbridge, yeah. you do Weymouth Compressor, which we've talked yes. about. about four. And you know what the and beauty of this people is? People are relentless. They are out here every time the we have the governor and the but activists. Let me just, yeah. They don't know relentless until they've seen this film, by the way. I mean, this is not just the <laughs> fight about climate change and communal action and worrying about not just their kids, but future generations. It almost made me cry when they spoke about it at the end of your film. We're not going to give it away. Thank the end you. of your film just beautifully but also you do you weave the history of cruelty that was directed at Native Americans from the you know cutting up their land to those residential schools where these kids oh, were taken God. away from their homes and basically tortured to something I had to terminate and relocate throw them in the cities let them lose and it's weaved so beautifully into the strength of they have today, but you know, one of the things uh, I mentioned to Marjorie, first of all, you did, you did just a brilliant job. Thank you. You've done almost everything, not almost, everything you've touched. Thank you. Uh, um, she was a corporate lawyer in between the rowing thing, by the way. Let's <laughs> not hold that against groan. her. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> how did they feel when you met the leader uh, and subsequently when you did all these wonderful interviews, how did they feel about a non-native uh, making this film? I don't, honestly, to this day, I'm not quite sure. And <laughs> I think they were like, what the hell is she doing here? <laughs> and it took, like I showed up, of course, in the beginning with no cameras, mm -hmm. began what I thought would be this David and Goliath story, this legal battle. And it really turned into something profoundly different because the elders, they're like, yeah, okay, we'll talk about our current battle with Enbridge, but do you know what happened five years mm -hmm. ago and how we stood up? And do you know what happened a hundred years ago where our people said, we're gonna show up for this fight? And what was so beautiful is they, they wanted the film to go somewhere else. And I was like, okay, we're, I gotta get out of the way. And it became really a historical, as you said, a historical retrospective, but each, each episode is punctuated by resilience, by defiance, by standing up. And as one um, band member said to me, he said, you know, we may not always win, uh, but we're gonna carry the scars to prove that we showed up for the fight when it counted. Well, you, you have this, this moment where a, a bunch of uh, groups from, from the uh, uh, tribe go back to Washington, D.C. Was it Millard Fillmore who was the president then? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. To, to M, M, M I L, L, L. Do you remember the Brady Bunch episode? <laughs> I'm afraid people. I don't. Yeah, I'm yeah. happy to say. <laughs> to get Millard Fillmore to exactly. sign this, this uh, agreement with them, which uh, uh, many people tried to break since then, but I thought that's a long way to Washington, D.C. But Fillmore did it. But nonetheless, the government kept taking and splitting up their more land. More and more land. So talk yeah. about that. So it's interesting because my co-partner, Alison Abner, she wrote for Narcos in West Wing, and her, oh. her matrilineal line uh, all went to the Carlisle boarding school, and she, and, and she said, Mary, we have to include the Dawes Act. And I'm, I'm like, yawn. <laughs> Dawes Act. Um, and then she's like, no, let me tell you why. And she said, this is about land. This is a story about land trying to keep our land, losing our land. And so ultimately, it's one of the reasons why we wove in sort of how the government took land, uh, violated existing treaties. Um, I mean, the Ojibwe gave up millions and millions and millions of acres for what were just small guaranteed treaty rights. And, and it's one of the reasons why 125,000 acres that really belong to the Bad River people, it's sacrosanct because it started with 
millions of acres, and now it's this tiny, tiny little corner of the earth that sits on Lake Superior. And the uh, oil company, Enbridge, tried to come in and buy them out with jobs. Yes, they did. And um, that has been the pressure that band members feel. You know, it's a. It's they a, were honest about it too, by yeah, the way. I, know, I mean, I, that's what I, I know, love. And yeah. I, because I, they were not wealthy people, yeah. needless to say. And some of them were like, I'm mixed. And I think, in fairness, uh, most band members would agree that if you have an opportunity to take a job, irrespective of who the employer is, take the job. But, but it doesn't mean you have to proselytize for your employer. And yeah. that's what's happened. And so that's been a bit of a challenge. So Mar Mary Mazio, I should know, by the way, the film is Bad River. And as she said, and we said, uh, it's opening a number of places, including AMC Boston, Common 19 on fr Friday. Yes, if you go to 530, I'll be there. I'll wave. Whoa. I'll say thank you for coming. Uh, we hope you buy tickets. We're giving a sizable portion of the profits back to Bad River. And oh, so, great. Yeah, so you know, please. Join us. We're here for a week, uh, running for at least a week, and if foot traffic is really solid, they'll, you know, AMC will. Continue. I should know this because I, I think I've seen everything you've ever made from when we met a century ago. Oh my God! Uh, no, I have. If you use drones, I mean, first of all, but in addition to the everything else, photography. It is so yeah. incredibly beautiful. This part of our country. Have you ever done? Drone stuff before? Yes, and we lost our second drone on this picture. So, yeah, we did. Oh. Mm -hmm. Yep, once, yeah, once again. Fall yeah. away. Note, note to self. How do you come away from, from this? I, are you different yeah. than you were? How? Yeah, how? I feel like um, just witnessing the strength <laughs> of this incredible. community and the selflessness with which they're approaching this issue. It's amazing. Like, I'm like, what more can I do as a person? Why am I not thinking more of community and more, how do I give back? Because the sacrifice that they're making on behalf of all of us is, um, it's excruciating and it's unbelievably inspiring. It is, time. by the way, if you are feeling down, inspiring. like Marjorie and very, I every day, if very. you listen to the show, it's inspiring. You know, we have Thursday, uh, we have Bill Bradley, one of the greatest basketball players who ever lived with us. He's done a one-person show about his whole life, which is incredible. Obviously, U.S. Senator later ran for... Grant Hill, who's also one of the greatest basketball players who ever lived, by the way, is one of the leaders of this effort. How's, yeah, I What's love your him. deal with him? So, Grant and I, uh, you know, he was in one of my early, early I do films. know that. He, he, I do. You remember, he I and his do mother. indeed, yes. We've stayed in touch. We and had Branson and yeah. his mother. Oh, great Was it family. Shaquille and who else? Yeah, yeah, and yeah, yeah. That was a great film. Yeah, go ahead. What was super, that called? Fun. Apple Pie. Okay, go ahead. Uh, so in any event, uh, we partnered back up with our last film, The Most Beautiful Thing. That was about the first mm -hmm. uh, high school boys African-American rowing team coming out of the west side of Chicago. Yeah. And so Grant and I had like honestly worked shoulder to shoulder on that project. It had remarkable impact after the film came out. Um, and so anyways, I turned to him after that and said, you know, I have long, long thought about a project about a native community. I had been called, if we have time, I have one second. Yeah, one dude, second. Oh, yeah. Um, I had been called right after making A Hero for Daisy, my very first, first movie, film. when I came on your show. About Title and you were, yeah, yep. came, in, came in and talked to Marjorie. And um, long story short, uh, Mac Hall, he was a Navajo coach on the Navajo reservation from Tuba City, Arizona. I can't remember like anybody I talked to yesterday, but I remember this clear as day. Tuba City, Arizona, and he said, you know, Mary, we have these extraordinary young women playing high school girls basketball. I can't get a single one of them recruited to the D1 schools. And he said, do you think a project might help dispel some of the stereotypical assumptions Americans carry? And I was like, oh, what a story. And I was, you know, it was my very first film. I couldn't, um, sorry, that was my phone. That's, it's okay. that's rude. Um, but it was my very first film, didn't get the funding. But his voice has been in my head for 20 years now. And so it took a while. But we got there. You know what else, too, um, I loved about this film is that, is that so many of the people you went to, you talked about uh, their ancestors always being with them and what they were doing for their future, if they didn't have any kids, their future kids, their future grandchildren, their great-grandchildren, the whole lineage thing, being aware of. And you thought, I don't know, how long have the Ojibwe's been out there? Oh, thousands and thousands, thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of, years, of yes. years. And that awareness that they had was just really, as you said, it was inspiring because we, they're so countercultural. I guess, is the bottom line. So much so. Because they actually care about each yeah. other and they care about us. 
<laughs> even though we're not there. The I mean, how of, unusual the, is that? The, the pictures of the forest of Lake Superior and the size of Lake Superior. Of course, it's a great lake, so naturally it's great, but you don't realize how big it is <laughs> That's the until name. you see this from above. It, it's spectacular. And, you know, one of the first things when I got out there to meet the chairman, he said, uh, we had met over Zoom because, you know, pandemic was full on. And he said, why don't you come out and do some canoe diplomacy? <laughs> what does like, that mean? I had no idea, but I was like, you paddle. <laughs> I'm Olympic in. rower, if you forgot, <laughs> by yeah. the way. Yes. How are you at canoeing? It's a little uh, different it's terrible. Uh, stroke. <laughs> Completely terrible. And I'm like, I'll come out. And he said, all right, set your alarm for 3 o'clock. We're going to get up early in the morning, and I have something. We're going to do a morning exercise. And so I wake up at 3, and he takes me um, to Waverly Beach, which is right on the shore of Lake Superior. And it's dark. And he said, okay, you stand here. And he goes further down the beach. He disappears. And I'm like, you know... I'm, I'm, I'm twitching. I'm like, I'm like, I don't think I should pull out my cell. I think that would be very cool. I know, I'm, uh, right? I'm getting, I'm new to this culture and this experience. And uh, so I'm just fidgety and I, I'm like, am I supposed to feel something? And then the sun began to rise over Lake Superior. Oh, and it was like, now time fell away. It yeah. was so spectacular. I was in the moment. It was transcendent. And I understood what it was and how hard the fight was going to be. And well, that the film has transcended too. Can all your other films that we've talked, some of which, 50 Eggs? 50eggs.com. This new film is badriverfilm.com. Badriverfilm.com. Yep. And if you're, uh, we would love for you to all come see the movie. We open the 15th, the first weekend, as you know, for movies, especially small documentaries, mm -hmm. is uh, really important. And a huge shout out, by the way, to our partners at AMC Theatres. I mean, for them to support a film like this, um, we also know that Bad River Tribal Council members are going to be fanning out and going to different cities to, oh, welcome, to welcome moviegoers. I don't know if we'll have anybody in Boston on March 15, but they're going to you know, Minneapolis and Madison and Chicago and Atlanta. And so it's really uh, wonderful to see the community react with a sense of pride around this project. Well, they should be proud yeah. and so should you. The film is brilliant. Go see it. And Marjorie's going to tell you yet again. Yeah. Where, Mary, it's great to see you. And with all, as we just so said over you. and over again, with all the bad news and sadness, everything, it's really inspiring and uplifting. So thank you very much, Mary Mazio. Thank you for having me, my it's friends. Great. We loved it. Mary Mazio is the director and writer behind the new documentary film we've been talking about, Bad River, premiering Friday in select theaters, including AMC Boston Common 19. It's right over here, uh, right on the Common. Of course, I guess that's why it's called AMC Boston Common. More information at badriverfilm.com. Mary Masio, thanks a oh. million. Mm -hmm. And all of her films, 50eggs.com. Yeah, 50eggs.com, that's right. 50eggs. Coming up after a quick break, it is time for Ask the Mayor with Boston Mayor Michelle Wu. She is here to take our questions and yours. Call or text at 877-301-8979. 877-301-8970. You're listening to Boston Public Radio, 89.7 GBH. one of the most affluent cities in the nation, but also one where the wealth of black households is dramatically lower than their white neighbors. Systematic racial inequality has a long history in Boston. From GBH News, I'm Soraya Wintersmith, host of What is Owed, a new podcast exploring what it looks like for one of America's oldest cities to figure out its reparations debt. Do you have thoughts to share about this issue? Call or text your comments to 617-958-6061. Funding for our programs comes from you. And Mass General Cancer Center, dedicated to providing the latest therapies and cancer specialists who are experienced in your cancer. When you hear the word cancer, their team is ready. Learn more at massgeneral.org slash cancer. And the Simmons Leadership Conference, Wednesday, April 3rd, in person and online. A day of inspiration, skill building, and networking. Featuring Trevor Noah, Gloria Steinem, and Padma Lakshmi. Inclusiveleadership.com. I'm Nicole Garcia, producer for BPR. 
and you're listening to 89.7 WGBH HD1 Boston, online at gbhnews.org. GBH News with NPR, what matters to you. Welcome back to Boston Public Radio. Jim Browdy and Marjorie Egan. We're live at the library streaming at youtube.com slash GBH News, facebook.com slash GBH News. Mayor Wu is in the building. She's somewhere in the library, and we're told she's about a minute away. So as we wait for the mayor, uh, the special counsel who wrote the report about Joe Biden and uh, the uh, documents that he had in his possession uh, and decided he should not be prosecuted. But he did gratuitously mention that one of the reasons he didn't prosecute him, in addition to the fact that he hadn't committed a crime, was he thought a jury would be sympathetic to an elderly man with a poor memory, et cetera. Totally gratuitous. Here is Adam Schiff, uh, obviously very involved in the impeachment. He's the leading candidate for the Senate seat in California. Here's Adam Schiff having a conversation during the hearing with special counsel Her, You understood to be released. I understood from the attorney general's public comments that he would make as much of my report public as he could consistent with legal requirements in DOJ policy. And you also understand DOJ policy that you are to take care not to prejudice the interests of the subject of an investigation, right? That is generally one of the interests that DOJ policy requires that prosecutors respect. And it was your obligation to follow that policy in this report, was it not? It was also my obligation to write a confidential report for the Attorney General explaining completely well, my what decision. What you did write was deeply prejudicial to the interests of the President. You say it wasn't political, and yet you must have understood. You must have understood the impact of your words. And by the way, uh, uh, one of the observations that uh, I have echoed, and I can't remember who made it originally, is not just one, is while her, I think, acted totally unprofessionally by throwing all that stuff in, uh, the relative weakness of Merrick Garland, the attorney general, uh, on some issues, including picking a Trump uh, uh, former U.S. attorney, thinking that all of a sudden the Trump allies are going to say, this is fair and we'll buy into it, It was so naive and so pathetic. And then... He had the power, maybe it was too late in the game, to edit this thing before it was released to the public. This effort to bend over backwards in an attempt to please people who can never be pleased about anything, as evidenced by the immigration bill that Republicans wrote and then voted against. Uh, uh, So shame on her and shame on Merrick Garland for doing this thing to begin with. I've often thought both... Not the investigation. There should have been an investigation, but who we put in charge of it. I've often thought Robert Mueller and Merrick Garland are operating in a different time. I agree with you. I agree uh, with you. The kind of niceties and and crossing your T's and dotting your I's era may be be over. But anyway, here is the mayor of Boston, Michelle Wu. Thank you very much for joining us Good to see you, Mayor Wu. How are you? Thank you. She's not even putting her things down. I mean... (laughs) Well, these are your things. Oh, you're incredible. Oh, my goodness. I could do well, that later. Can I tell you, by the way, we have some things for you, not because we got them, but because two chefs were here, Jody yes. Adams and Tracy <laughs> Chang. So we're going to share. By the way, if you want to speak to the mayor, she'll hear, she's here for the rest of the show, 50 minutes. You can reach her by text or phone at 877-301-8970. Or if you're at the library, if you walk over to Hannah, hello, Hannah, there would be Hannah, our coworker, and say, I'd like to ask the mayor a question. There's a fairly good shot. You'll get to ask the mayor a question Face to face. Mayor Wu, it's good to see you. Thanks nice for being here. Yeah. Thank you. Good to be and, back. and Mayor Wu, I think you just came from something involving the Franklin Cummings Tech School. That's we being... shoveled some dirt for yeah. the official groundbreaking. Tell what people is it? about that. Yeah, so, I mean, this is a several hundred year institution that was founded with a donation from Benjamin Franklin himself to ensure that there would be training facilities for working people for all backgrounds and the kind of apprenticeship and vocational education that he had. And um, they had been in um, Bay Village and uh, now they are, they needed more space, they needed um, more uh, modernized um, training equipment and facilities. And so they are building a brand new facility right in Nubian Square. Nice. Um, it's gonna be fantastic. Well, you know, that sounds sort of analogous to uh, a, uh, an expansion that didn't go quite so well. The O'Brien move to West Roxbury. I think people know you basically said we're not going to go ahead with this thing, in great part because of community concern, and correct me if I'm, I'm wrong. What I'm interested, how hard is that for you to have to rescind something that you believed in in the face of public 
opposition. That's got to be tough, is it? Well, I mean, the, that's the whole point of community process is to hear and vet and bring in all different perspectives. Um, you know, this was, we had found an opportunity that in the bigger picture, because Madison Park, which, is, which currently shares the same campus as the O'Brien School, mm -hmm. Um, and is our only vocational technical high school because we knew that Madison Park needed and should be prioritized for major renovations and uh, and at that point we had planned a major expansion. Um, for years and years, the O'Brien School had been promised they would get their own building anyway. They were not in initially intended to share that same campus. They had been displaced from their former building and promised one day that they would get their own space. So there was a chance to um, expand the O'Brien and also tack on in some ways, uh, find a way to accelerate the reconstruction and renovation process for a new O'Brien building because we have such a great footprint in West mm -hmm. Roxbury. But we heard loud and clear from community members that there wasn't consensus in understanding the big picture of why a move was necessary or should happen and um, the transportation issues in West Roxbury, we had not solved in the first presentation. It's very, you know, very different geographic location. Now, many months later, we have a commitment from the MBTA to build mm -hmm. a commuter rail stop there. But I think there were, you know, definitely a lot of lessons learned there. Madison Park will continue in, in its renovation. The O'Brien will stay where they are. And in some ways, this is both the silver lining, but also a sad fact of the big picture, is that we have so many different schools, 100 buildings that are in need of major renovation. So because the O'Brien isn't moving, doesn't mean we're now falling back on our agenda. It's just a different school out of the 100 that will be moving for now. What are the lessons? What are a couple of the lessons learned for you personally? I think we are used to, in Boston, hearing things that have been presented in a one-off case, you know, case-by-case case scenario with lots of uh, broken promises, with lots of um, ideas and, and commitments made that eventually weren't kept. And that means that each conversation now comes with a lot of context and a, a need to really build trust as the first step. In my mind, initially, you know, I'm new in this, was new in this role, realizing that four years is a, a short time for a, a major construction project, so we needed to get going as quickly as possible, and let's make a decision with a proposal on the table, which could accelerate the conversation. But in some ways, it probably is best in a city like Boston to connect the dots across the entire district and start without any proposals on the table, just to start from what do we want to see with this West Roxbury site all on its own? What do we want to see for the O'Brien or English High or each of our high schools all on our own and then helping kind of some of those um, consistent themes fit together with our long-term facilities plan. One last question about that, but before, let me just say again, the number is 877-301-8970 to call or text the mayor. Based on what you learned from the, well, two questions. One, the original one, how hard was it for you personally to reverse your own recommendation? And two, based on what you learned, if you had done it differently based on those things, do you think he could have prevailed here? Um, well, okay, so how hard was that? I mean, the West Roxbury site is, it's the dream location for a large high school. It has every imaginable athletic facilities already there, ready to go. It's in the middle of conservation and green space. Uh, we figured out how to work with the MBTA to make a major investment in public transportation that would be reliable anyway. So I still believe that we need an education use there. There have been all sorts of ideas floated for that space in the past, but we need our school system to have every possible resource, and there is no other site like that with the space mm -hmm. available to build something remarkable out. Like, a, you know, there are lots of families that I talk to in the course of this process who are either spending their hard-earned dollars on their child's education because they aren't sure that the options in front of them in the public district are the, the best that they could find and they have decided to sacrifice and pay for education or others who are getting on a bus or going far away through the METCO program or other ways that they are leaving their home neighborhoods and, and district in order to, try, again, try to find an option that they believe is the best investment. If you go and look at these suburban schools and some of the places where our young people are already traveling great distances to go to, 
it is this kind of all-inclusive campus feel for a high school. It has a space for every possible activity that you'd want, every kind of educational opportunity. We have that in a location, and we just need to, we're not sure exactly what school could fit there or what combination of schools, but that's something I'm not giving up on. And then in terms of the O'Brien, I mean, they have been promised a building for several decades at mm -hmm. this point. And so um, I think it's hard to have long, long-term conversations in a district that is so used to the push and pull of a shrinking pie and having to really fight just to maintain your own baseline level of resources. And so um, we're trying our best now to get information out there so that everyone can see on their own with full transparency, what are the trade-offs, what are the needs? You know, the O'Brien School actually in the list of all of our high schools where we've now developed a, a numeric uh, criteria to understand how all the facilities needs fit together, they are ranked 17th out of uh, 35 buildings that different high schools are in. And so, in fact, there are a lot of high schools that are in rougher shape than, than that particular school. So now that everything's going back in the pot, we're going to have um, the bigger picture conversations about how to really start with those areas that need it the absolute most. Um, and it will take longer than I would like to get through the entire district, but we'll keep trying to find creative solutions to accelerate you that. You still seem to be saying this was the right solution. You just didn't sell it properly. Is that quickly? Is that a fair summary? I think we're not there yet as a city in having the same shared um, understanding of and acceptance of the facts, right? I've seen the data for where students live. We looked at not just where our high schoolers who are in BPS live right now and how they're getting bussed all around, and a lot of them have a very long transportation journey even to get to school, but we looked at where our kindergartners currently live because these are really the high schoolers we're planning uh -huh. for by the time these buildings are built. And uh, we looked at the students and families who are not choosing BPS right now. And there's a gigantic hole. There is no high school, in Boston Public High School, in the West Roxbury, mm -hmm. Roslindale area at all. Whereas some of the much smaller neighborhoods like Charlestown and other places, or Roxbury has three or four high schools, depending on how you kind of count the boundaries. And so, you know, there, there are some bigger picture reasons, but we often have a conversation and it's so focused on the here and now and mm -hmm. a small community and we need to do a better job of laying the foundation to think bigger picture and holistically. Uh, to get to Mayor Wu, 877-301-8970. You know, one more thing uh, before we uh, get to the calls and the text. Um, you may have to help me out on this, Jim, because I uh, can't find the story, but basically there was this uh, report this morning that talked about how I think about 25% of young people in their 20s in Boston want to leave Greater Boston because they can't afford a house, uh, they can't afford a job to pay them enough money to pay the rent, the tea isn't working. Uh, Particularly LGBTQ people and young black and women. And young black women, that, that, that's correct. Tell me who did the study, though. That's what I don't have I don't in have front it of in front of me at the moment. Well, in any case, sure it was really is. frightening because it's, it's, it is a, a dilemma, and I'm afraid that by the time we do have enough housing, all these, all these talented people are going to go to Baltimore or Cleveland or something, God forbid, but you know that at least they can afford a place to live there. What do you, what do you make of that? There's so much going for us in Boston. We, we have, in some ways, that thing that you can't just get out of thin air, which is a strong community and the appeal of living in a place that, that really can feel like home. It has all the elements of being walkable and welcoming and diverse and historic and, and beautiful and clean and safe. Um, we really need to just get the basics right so that everyone who wants to live in Boston actually can. There are a lot of places right now that are struggling to become the place that people want to go to, yeah. but we have the opposite problem where people want to be here, but then they, they can't make it past the hurdles of affordability and all the other pieces to fit your life together. It's housing, it's childcare costs, it's the transportation system, it's the quality and um, kind of guarantee of quality public education across the entire district, not just in lots of bright spots here and there. So those are, those are the pieces that we're focused on, and we are seeing forward movement in a lot of them, but um, we can't keep up fast enough with how quickly the kind of knowledge and innovation economy is shifting. We are um, oftentimes digging out from decades and decades of 
underinvestment on these major infrastructure issues, whether it's housing that wasn't built over many decades and now we're very far below the number that we need to meet demand, or the public transportation system, or even our school building facilities that we are really looking at an entire district of multiple deck. I mean, you know, nearly a century in some cases of, of needing to catch up on. Let's go to Susan and Clinton. You're on with the mayor of the city of Boston, Michelle Wu. Hi, Susan. Hi, thank you for taking my call. Thanks. Um, I'm calling for a friend of mine who uh, needs to bring his daughter to Mass General Bowden Square office and needs a handicapped parking spot. At least two handicapped parking spots have been removed for the bike lane. The handicapped spots that have been removed are on Cambridge Street, westbound between Sudbury Street and New Sheridan Street. Did I say that properly? Um, it would, um, they really would like to have those spots back because he leaves from another town and has to drive around until he can get a spot close enough. And sometimes he just needs to drop his daughter off and just attend the, um, the meeting through his phone because he can't find a uh, spot close enough. Let's hear what the mayor has to say, Susan. Thank you um, for, for highlighting this. And um, on behalf of uh, someone you care about, I, I know those um, conversations are really hard when, again, we have the, the need and the desire to be involved, to tap into the incredible resources, for example, in this case, in, in that area, whether it's healthcare related or, or um, kind of something related to economic opportunities. But then there's, there's a an infrastructure barrier here. Um, I, I'm not familiar entirely with the um, trade-offs here of whether there were roadway decisions that were made that, that gave up spots or if they were relocated to somewhere else. Uh, I know when we talk about losing parking, that is often a very, very difficult, um, you know, we, we try to, again, if it's a city project, we try to measure very carefully to understand the exact impact that that would have and how possible to preserve as much as possible. Um, but then when it comes to accessible parking spaces, that, that is a priority. So I will try to find out more if maybe my hope is that there might have been more created somewhere uh, nearby or in the area to make up for that, but I will look into it. Susan, don't hang up. If you, is it okay with you, uh, Mayor Wu? If she stays on the line, we get your contact information. Someone from the mayor's office will uh, let you know what's up there. Susan, thank you for the call. I believe we have Everett at the Boston Public Library microphone with a question about zoning reform. Is Everett there? Where's Everett? Yep. Where'd he go? Oh, there he is. Hi, hey, Everett. Everett. Thank you for taking my question. Um, I'm wondering about how the process of uh, Boston redoing its zoning laws is going. I'm particularly curious on the role of single family homes in Boston, because I know across the country some cities are questioning the role of the housing time. Thank you. Great. Ah, this is my, this made my day. A question on zoning. Oh, this is the Can't best. beat zoning, I always say. <laughs> no, that's so hard to get people interested about zoning, and it is the most important thing that we could be working on. It, it literally affects every other issue around how our city fits together. Everything that we were just discussing about what makes a community livable is defined by the rules that set how our neighborhoods and communities grow and what the baseline requirements are. So uh, we are embarking on the first ever citywide major rezoning effort since 1965. Uh, we are starting with our squares and streets approach, which will focus on um, more manageable, smaller corridors in commercial business districts in our neighborhoods as a place to build that muscle, uh, really start shifting our zoning code towards uh, from height-based and, and FAR-based to form-based zoning, which is much more about capturing the shapes and the design and what really makes a neighborhood feel unique and, and maintain its character. Um, and so that is going to be the focus that Roslindale and Hyde Park are two of the first communities in that process of a six to nine month community planning process that will end up changing the zoning code and we will rotate around the city until we can kind of cover citywide. Um, in terms of housing in particular and single family housing, that won't apply so much right now in this first phase because uh, these tend to be more multi-use districts anyway and we're looking to um, increase density where it makes sense and add more housing anywhere possible. Um, but there have been lots of conversations about whether an affordable housing overlay uh, to the zoning code or um, identifying places where some, some of those changes might make sense. We try to start with the places where we get the most bang for the buck in terms of density that um, already kind of fits in. In a lot of places in Boston, you'll see 
the existing housing stock is already of a higher density than the zoning code currently allows because everything has gone through appeals and variances and um, that is that issue is certainly in the conversation for when we expand to more residential areas as well. By the way, that was the biggest smile I've seen on your face in months <laughs> whenever it asked the zoning question. Okay. Can I ask another kid's question? Uh, kids, because we were talking about schools a minute ago. We have celebrated with you this BPS Sundays thing. People know it is the museum access for kids in the Boston Public Schools. First two Sundays of the month. I think it's a seven-month pilot. I may be off a little. That's right. For Boston Public Schools, you can bring three people with you. You have, uh, uh, there have been suggestions suggestions by members of the city council and others that uh, kids in the city who go to parochial schools, MECO kids, private school kids, where the demographics are not terribly different, should be included. I believe your response is during the pilot, we're going to stay with what we have and then judge it and decide in the future. Go back to the beginning. Why did you decide not to include all school age kids in the program at, when it started? Yeah, I mean, believe me, if I could wave a magic wand and in my role make it so that museums were free for everyone and they could still financially support themselves. That is, that is my dream and um, definitely what I think, uh, again, a type of critical infrastructure that makes communities as special as they are. Um, there is a reason why we have never had a program like this before in Boston. It is very hard to coordinate uh, six different institutions, all wildly different in their physical uh, space constraints in their revenue mm -hmm. models, in their um, timing and the programs and, and how they interact, the age range that, that tends to frequent those institutions. And so um, our goal was, again, to get something started so we could learn and think about how to make it permanent. Um, it took a year to get a negotiation with all of those institutions to a place where people were, uh, those groups were on the same page because they are, they are struggling right now coming out of the pandemic, which was possibly the most disruptive and financially uh, difficult time for institutions that had to be shut down entirely to tourism and, and visitors. They are still making their way out of that financial hit. Um, and so to then say, well, we're going to try to <laughs> send more people in who will not add at all to the finances, it was a really big leap of faith for those museums and cultural institutions. Now, what the key kind of argument here that the city was making and that we ultimately were able to come to alignment on is that this was not so much about taking away the monthly memberships to, from people who are paying to go to those museums already, but tapping into a community and set of potential visitors who have not been showing mm -hmm. up at all and, and are not on, you know, not losing revenue uh, because we're actually bringing an entirely new audience in. And that, that question of if it is free, who will come? How often will they come? How will they make decisions? Um, how do we ensure that this actually accomplishes the goal that was, goals that we set out? That could only happen from starting smaller first and having the connections to that community to really understand why people are making the decisions that they're making. So here's what we're measuring. And so far, we've been collecting a lot of this data. Um, who's going? How do they find out about it? Whether it's their first time at these institutions, who they're bringing with them. And what we saw is that or what we've seen so far, uh, I was just at the Children's Museum on Sunday for this last weekend with, with my kids, and um, there wasn't that much for me to do because they were just wanting to climb up and down in the structure the whole time and I can't <laughs> fit in there. So um, I got to hear from a lot of families who were coming by. And um, a lot of BPS families told me anecdotally that it was their first time there. And then the museum team, um, the president, um, Carol Chernow, and her team said that their data shows that 45% so far of the uh, BPS families who are coming have said it is their very first time at the museum. So half of the now several thousand uh, visitors lived in Boston, had never been to the Boston Children's Museum before. Wow. Now, why can't we expand it right away? Um, one, opening it up all the way, I think, introduces the level of unpredictability for these institutions, the aquarium, especially with tighter quarters. They already are worried about whether we're going to reach that capacity limit where they're going to have to turn away paying customers and visitors at the door because of the commitments to BPS. And so we want to watch that very carefully. The attendance has grown every single weekend. The other factor is that we believe that a big part of the reason why families are showing up who've never come before, a lot of this is the financial 
uh, taking down the financial barrier, and a lot of it is an information barrier. So now that we're able to email, call, put out information through the ways that schools communicate with their students, we can reach every single family and we know how they're finding out about it. We don't have that mechanism to communicate with all the students and families in the other um, kind of communities that we're talking about here. This was the biggest bang for the buck uh, with one leader in Superintendent Mary Skipper and 43, 45,000 students and their families. When we're talking about even charter schools, it's, I mean, the level of complexity that introduces to bring in so many different partners to coordinate, it, it was just beyond the scope of but what we could do But is that the ultimate goal? Is the ultimate goal post-pilot, assuming it's judged well, to do that kind of expansion? Yeah, I think the goal is to understand how this uh, affects and impacts, or how it sits differently for each institution uh -huh. in terms of their exact financial um, needs to meet the demand, um, how we can best ensure that families are actually going and, and we, we know and, and they're finding out about it, um, and also to hear from the families themselves. Right? Some people had said to me at the museum on Sunday, could it be a different day of the week because the MBTA schedule is very different and much more limited on Sunday, and so to wait for the train, we had to hit it exactly right, et cetera. So, you know, there's a lot of factors. How many weekends or how many days per month is it free? Who does this apply to? How many family members can join the student for free? So there's a lot that we are going to look at, and we'll be very happy to share all that data. So you don't probably. know about possible expansion yet until you look at the it data It is on very this. much my hope that we can okay. expand. My sense is that we'll need to find some more okay. funding for that to happen, and that, that will be something that we have to plan out. You know, Mary, well, before we get to Mark and Dorchester, I just wonder, as long as you're talking about kids in school in Boston, do you think kids in school in Boston should be able to have cell phones? We talked about this earlier with our callers saying that more and more school, states are saying no more cell phones because kids aren't learning. And your kids might be too young for cell phones, but maybe not. Your kids have They're cell phones? They're never going to have cell phones. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Do they really um, not? What are they, 7 and 10? Uh, six, and nine. 6 and 9. I don't know. We're sort of eyeing teenage years as maybe yeah. one... Uh, point where, although some families have shared, they have some of their young people who are younger, they might, there's now technology where you can have something on your wrist yes. where all it does is take a call from the, the families or mm -hmm. whatever's programmed in. From the or, mayor, I think. <laughs> <as long laughs> yeah. as really, yeah, but do you have an opinion about cell phones in schools? You know, I need to hear more from our Boston educators, but yeah. from what I've read and heard in other communities and kind of just in the news generally, it does seem to make sense that, I, I know as a parent, I'm incredibly distracted when I have my phone I at know. home, just trying to do things that I want to do and spend time with my kids and, and this and that. It just, it changes the dynamic. And so I think in places where it can work, um, it, anything to kind of simplify the um, experience of being a student in a very stressful time, especially, it, you know, in the adolescent and uh, teenage years, I think, I think all the best, all the better for learning and all that. Now, you know, are there real um, concerns around how our young people are having to deal with adult issues very early on now, especially in um, a, a district like Boston and urban districts? We know that they are taking on a lot of family responsibilities too, but I, don't, I would hope that we could have a situation where maybe, you know, things kind of stay tucked away during yeah. learning time okay. and, and, you know, get Is your nine-year-old mad at you and your husband? So actually we are on a no video game, um, wow. no phone thing, but uh, it doesn't mean, somehow they still know how to get into my phone <laughs> and use my, every time I look at my pictures, there's new little documentaries they've made. Yeah, and your kid photos. called me the other day. I forgot to tell you. Yeah. Mark in Dorchester, you're on Boston Public Radio with the mayor, Michelle Wu. Welcome, Mark. Hi, Jim. Hi, Marjorie. Long time Hi. listener. Thank, Thank you. you. Good afternoon, Mayor Wu. Good afternoon. Um, I have a question for you, which is, um, I live in a very nice neighborhood in Dorchester, and many of the two and three family homes have been sold to uh, corporations or absentee landlords. And uh, I'm seeing the, uh, the, uh, the lack of maintenance on these properties. Oftentimes, the yards are filled with trash and rubbish. And um, I love the 311 system. But my question is this. Uh, we have many repeat offenders, and um, the landlords are not doing anything about it. And what we find is the second and third um, uh, fines are only $25. And, you know, the, of course, the rental income 
is now for a, a three family approaching eighty to one hundred thousand a year, and that you know a twenty five dollar fine is not really providing any incentive for a landlord to clean up their act. So, what's your question, um, Mark, for the mayor? Know, oh, here it comes. Go ahead. My 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 question is: um, Is there a way to increase the fine structure so absentee landlords or any landlord pays attention to the, and corrects the problem. We got it, Mark. Thank you much for your call. We appreciate it. Yes, um, there is a way to do so, and it is... Okay, so I won't try to go through all the complications, but usually there, um, through state law, there are some caps that are set, and then cities can kind of decide within that range how high they want to go up to. And so this applies to, for example, fines for not shoveling snow um, on your property or this kind of uh, kind of clean it or, or, or get a ticket um, situation or, or other property related costs. Um, in the past, I know the city council has upped those fines in different categories, precisely for this case where it just the incentives don't make sense. Um, and so we'd have to do a double check of where we are with relative to the state threshold, but it sounds like it's well below that and um, certainly something that we could explore um, and and make sure we're changing the uh, numbers for the right incentives, but also then not to create undue burdens on our own existing uh, residents and uh, owner-occupied properties as well. Mark, thanks. We have to take a break. Before we do, you always bring us something to oh, right. celebrate a local business or enterprise. What's today? Okay, this, today is City of Boston swag oh, again. Swim it's safe. Oh, swim safe. Um, oh, we want to talk yeah, about that. Good, thank you. a bag and towel from our oh, official city swim program. Thank you. Which has just thank kicked you. off. Thank you. Tell will, us about swim safe. So um, there are free swim lessons for every generation within the family. It's part of our commitment that every child growing up in Boston should know how to swim, know how to ride a bike, be involved in the arts, sports, and get their hands dirty in the dirt. And that's a family affair. Um, this year we will have... 12 pools and the beach at uh, behind the Curly Community Center oh, open compared to just seven pools last summer. So we're steadily making progress on all the renovations and again, digging out from lots of years of um, needing to fix facilities, but check it out. And um, as Boston gets hotter over the summer, our pools are more and more important as well. And I'm really grateful to our um, human services cabinet and BCYF, the uh, Boston Children Youth and Centers for Youth and Families for focusing on swimming as a really important part of how we contribute. Okay, so you always bring us stuff. We never bring you anything. We still didn't bring you anything, but <laughs> indirectly, <laughs> Tracy Chang from Pago, we're regifting, yeah. exactly. <laughs> yes. This is, I think, for your children. I don't know if they're allowed to eat sweets either, but we're gonna give it to you. <laughs> it's fabulous cheesecake from Pago with some kind of berries on it. And we're gonna give you a baklava from Jody Adams, wow. Saloniki, and tell your kids it's from two wonderful chefs. <laughs> Thank you so much. Well, that's Our pleasure. the voice of Michelle Wu, the mayor of the city of Boston. She's gonna be with us till the top of the hour, taking a quick break though. You're listening to Boston Public Radio, 89.7 GBH, broadcasting live from the Boston Public Library and streaming at facebook.com slash GBH News and youtube.com slash GBH News. Get ready for Books and Brews, a night of pints and conversation with best-selling author Hank Phillippe Ryan. Join GBH at Widowmaker Taproom and Kitchen in Brighton, where Ryan will discuss her latest thriller, One Wrong Word. Bring your burning questions, for there'll be a chance to chat in person with the author. It's all happening on Tuesday, March 19th at 7 p.m. Tickets are free, but registration is required. Learn more and reserve your tickets now at gbh.org events. Our programs are made possible thanks to you. And Trinity Rep, celebrating 60 years with August Wilson's Fences, a Pulitzer Prize-winning drama returning to Trinity Rep's stage March 21st through April 28th. Tickets and more at trinityrep.com. And Mass General Brigham Health Plan. Innovative plans, coverage, and a broad network of doctors. Mass General Brigham Health Plan, with you every day. For more information, you can visit massgeneralbrighamhealthplan.org. Welcome back to Boston Public uh, Radio. We're live at the Boston Public Library, streaming at youtube.com and facebook.com slash GBH News. And we're for the rest of the hour. We're continuing with Ask the Mayor with Michelle Wu. You can call her, no, there's one open line, 877-301-8970, or text her, or do like William has done, come at the library at the Boston Public Library. William, welcome to the show. Thank you, Lou. This is not 
the circumstances under which I wanted to meet with you. I am 77, an Asian American. I live on food in East Boston. Thus, I am socially vulnerable to scams. I was scammed out of $2,000 from my brand new Rockland Trust account. The bank was unsympathetic, saying, because I had taken the money out to buy gift cards. I got a call in the morning from Geek Squad saying I had purchased two years of uh, service. They said, if this is in error, please call this number. I did, and that started the day where he not only had me take the $2,000 out, but charged my credit card of uh, $3,500 uh, at uh, Target charged to um, American Express. And you want to know, William, if there's something the mayor could do or recommend that could be done to help you. Is that where you I are? I sure would like to bring a lot of heat on the Well, let's the, hear if the, the mayor can help. William, we really appreciate your asking your uh, question. Thank you for coming. Um, I am so sorry to hear about that, but very glad to meet you, and um, I'll chat with you a little bit afterwards. I, I would love to get your information so that we can follow up. Some of, uh, that some of this sounds like maybe some consumer protection um, steps that can involve other levels of government, but we can get you connected into them and um, do our best to connect you to where you where the services that you need to help. So don't leave. Stick around. The mayor is going to talk to you. Thank you, William. We really appreciate it. Mayor Wu, we've got someone, Stephen from Jamaica Plain, that wants to talk about uh, the White Stadium proposal. We have several texts about that, too. So tell people what is going on with White Stadium uh, in the Franklin Park. Sure. Does Stephen have a specific question well, on Steve, there? Or, oh, I, Why don't we sorry. take him and then yeah, let we her should, we expand? We should take Stephen. Yeah. I'm sorry. That's the way to do it. Go JP. ahead, Stephen. Hi, Stephen. Hi. Um, thanks for taking my call, Mayor. Um, I'm a big supporter of this, of the proposed white stadium renovations. Um, but my question is that uh, the parking impact for non-soccer events. Um, we've looked through the proposal from uh, the city and we see that for soccer events, there are four satellite areas where people can um, go to and then shuttle into a game. But my question is, what about big events at that renovated site for non-soccer events? Great question. Um, so I will say that um, we are making really good progress and um, to, in order to get final approvals for the development and renovation of this project, we need to have a finalized transportation and parking plan with it, so that will that's part of the requirement to um, kind of officially start construction. We are going to host, uh, I believe the team and the city are working on um, several workshops in the month of April with neighbors like yourself to go through all the details. So nothing is finalized at this point. The, I think the plan is to have some satellite locations just because there's not much parking within the park and we are not going to pave over um, the beautiful uh, Frederick Law Olmsted green space. Um, but I will note that Franklin Park regularly does host very, very large events, some much larger than the uh, maximum audience of the soccer game. BAMS Fest, for example, and some other events on the place said regularly get 20,000 people and um, they currently don't have a transportation or parking plan whatsoever. So our hope is that actually working this out for the soccer team and applicable, as you said, for the times when there will be other events within the stadium, but also when there are events, uh, not necessarily in the stadium, but in the park in general, that this will be a, a major asset and value add of this partnership as well. So we probably needed to do something like this for some time, and this is a catalyst for us to do it, um, but we are wading through the various routes that shuttles might take and when and how. Um, for the games in particular, you know, the, the very conservative maximal estimate is 20, 20 games a season, kind of between the March and, you know, September, October timeframe. 
Um, currently, every National Women's Soccer League team plays 13 home games. So it's far short of the 20. They're adding a few teams, but we're not actually sure if it'll still be that every team plays every team. So it'll be somewhere in the probably 13 to 15 um, home games a, a season, something like one or two um, home games per month. So it's, it's, it's going to be pretty spread out. Um, and that does mean that there's lots of opportunity for other major events, whether it's the BPS graduations that already happened there, um, home football games at the end of the season, home soccer games for any number of our BPS student uh, teams, other events that the community wants to see. This will be open for public use and we want to get as much of that in as possible and that will require having a, a strong circulation and um, traffic management plan. Stephen, you thanks. Know, as a follow-up text on this from Anna Jamaica Plain, just to preface, um, there has been some blowback about the White Stadium plan because, of, as you say, the football teams will not be able to play there till the end of Soccer. the season. Well, no, that, oh, the well, high school yes. football oh, yeah, teams, sorry. Will not be yes. able to be there to the end of the season. They're so upset about that. Uh, and this person, Anne from Jamaica Plain, wants to know if it doesn't work out, the soccer team has already committed $30 million. The city has committed $50 million. If it doesn't work out with the soccer team, will the city pull its $50 million investment? Uh, just even though, as you pointed out, Ms., uh, Madam Mayor, that the uh, stadium needs significant renovation. Yeah, okay, let me talk about both pieces because I think they're both important. Um, on football, first, there are seven varsity football teams um, across the entire BPS district. Two of them use Franklin Park, or use White Stadium as their home venue for their games, Boston Latin School and Boston Latin Academy. Uh, they each have five home games that they play in the stadium. Their practices, they actually don't play at all in the stadium right now. One team plays at a different field for their practices. The other team uses the playstead, which is outside of um, the stadium, but in Franklin Park, which will still be available. Um, and so we're talking about um, five games for each of the teams that are what's potentially going to need to find a different home. Um, and that, and that, that's it. And I don't even think it will be five because we will, uh, the, the football season usually extends longer than the soccer season. So we'll be able to accommodate hopefully some of those with the scheduling of the team towards the end of the uh, calendar year. And then after those games, the citywide championships and those kind of large final games, we'll be able to get all the teams in to play some of the, those end of season games there. So in fact, football usage of the stadium should actually increase with this as well. Uh, in addition, and especially with the increase to soccer and track and again, larger um, community events. Uh, and, and for the, these two football teams, even during construction, when there will be a little bit of disruption for their home games and for their practices, the city is investing in two other fields so that they will have brand new scoreboards, uh, fields, and um, the, the larger investment that is being made possible in youth sports, including football here, is actually a net positive here and, and not uh, taking anything away. On the um, $50 million side, <laughs> we think this is, um, you know, the, our budgets for construction projects keep going up and up and up as time goes by. Uh, that is the commitment that we're able to make from the capital budget right now to do half of a stadium with the team uh, building the other half and fixing up the field and maintaining it in perpetuity. There are two considerations here. One is that, again, this is part of, this is a BPS facility. So with 100 other buildings that are in much need of investment, we won't be able to prioritize. Without the partnership to make the whole stadium possible, we're not gonna be able to prioritize making half the stadium's renovations in there instead of doing over a, another school that badly needs it. So in some ways it is that if this doesn't happen to the kind of potential and standard that we believe our student athletes deserve, then those dollars will be best used elsewhere within the BPS footprint. There's many, many uses. The other important part about this partnership is that the soccer team will end up, again, playing those 13, 15 games, having some of their practices. That will represent less than 10% of the total usage of the stadium. The usage for BPS is going to more than triple in terms of the number of hours. Sometimes there's this belief that it's busy all the time and now the soccer team will be using it instead of our students, but the reality is that most of the time when you go by there, the stadium is chained and locked up. It's not used that often and football, 
soccer, they've all been used track, have been using it less and less and less frequently because the facilities don't even meet state competition standards anymore. They're in that bad of shape. And so we need to not only fix it up, but for once, unlike decades before, have the resources to maintain it annually. And the partnership also includes lease uh, revenues, profit sharing, so that we will have resources to build up Franklin Park and fulfill elements of the action plan in addition to maintaining the stadium and having a, a sustainable plan unlike the cities, you know, unlike how we've ever had it before. Very, very, very quickly. These are the real world considerations. Obviously, we've discussed with you the uh, Emerald Necklace Conservancy first lawsuit they've filed, filed against the city. One of the contentions they make is a legal one, that there's an illegal conversion of public land for private use, uh, uh, obviously you disagree, I assume, so you're nodding in agreement. Are you nego is there any negotiations going on between the city I and mean, the, the plaintiffs? Or? We had, um, I met with the board members, had had conversations, and then um, did not even hear that they had filed a lawsuit until the Boston Globe columnist reached out to tell us okay. that they had seen it first. And so we are in court now. We had a hearing last week before the judge. We hope uh, there's some deadlines this week for more responsive documents from both sides. And They're seeking an injunction to hold to to stop the stay any demolition. Yep, yeah. um, and we hope that okay. there will be at least a first reaction later um, this month or maybe even the week after that. Um, I think, you know, in terms of the legal argument, this this is a complex deal uh, and proposal. No other city in the country has a professional sports team that is going to be located in a stadium owned by a public school district. To have not only a team not be taking away public facilities, but actually investing in them is remarkable. And um, the, the terms of this lease of White Stadium, of the underlying trust fund, there are lots of examples where even Frederick Law Olmsted, when he designed the park, envisioned private entities providing refreshment, drawing people in, and getting more people to fall in love with the park through having events to go to. You know, uh, we talk, used to talk to you every month about the situation in Mass and Cass. Obviously, it's been clear. Tori Bedford, our colleague, did a story about how a lot of the nonprofit groups that provide support to those who spent most of their lives at Mass and Cass have had an impossible time uh, locating a lot of these people to provide the support they need to not only live decent lives, but to have hope and stay, stay alive. How are you addressing that concern? We have a very, um, I mean, just it's, there's nowhere else that has such a um, tight knit and strong ecosystem of provider organizations working with city and state agencies to serve community members. And uh, Boston really is the national standard when it comes to addressing homelessness and um, tying in and making sure that we're looking holistically at substance use and mental health along, alongside that. Uh, we continue to be in uh, coalition with those groups around next steps. Uh, we have not at, by any means said that we're done with Mass and Cass and, and turning the page. But have you um, lost touch with a significant number? Are you able to track and identify so you can continue to provide support? So um, the residents of the former encampments at Mass and Cass, the 200 some people and those who have um, been working with the city, we are, there's, there's many, many ways to stay in touch and, and track and um, continue providing services. And in fact, on the, in the November kind of mobilization effort when everyone was connected to housing and shelter, there was a list of residents who we were not able, who did not end up showing up at their assigned um, and, and agreed upon locations that they, they wanted to move into. And the team has been diligently in the months since then tracking down and finding. We were down to the last five people. Um, and even so, we believe some of them may have connect, reconnected with family. The reality is that it was a very free-flowing situation. There were lots of people coming in from outside Boston and certainly, and even outside Massachusetts. And so some of this has been um, family reunification efforts. Some of this has been helping everyone understand and connect to the resources available in the kind of spectrum of treatment into permanent housing. And there have been hundreds of um, community members who have now been able to access that permanent mm -hmm. housing through this. I will say there's a, um, you know, we are experiencing some connection also with strain on our shelter system with the migrant uh, crisis and families, newly arrived migrant families. Yeah. At this point, you know, a couple 
weeks ago, we were at 25% of our um, beds within our city shelter system. That's not to serve the family shelters that the state is responsible for, but just individuals who are not connected to a family unit. 25% of those shelter beds that had been more of the uh, places where we were serving folks from Mass and Cass, 25% were um, mi newly arrived migrant individuals. And now we're at over a third of those beds are um, uh, migrant residents. And so we are starting to see multiple needs all layered on top of the underlying housing crisis. And um, so we're trying to make sure people get the support to exit shelter as mm -hmm. quickly as possible, to be able to have permanent housing, um, but it is all, on, all hands on deck at this point. Well, you talked before about how Roxbury seems to be getting more than its fair share of the burden for housing migrants, that people are not going to Brookline or Wellesley or Newton, and that's still continuing, I guess. We have a minute. Oh, sorry. No, 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 it's fine. I'm just telling the mayor. Yeah. Well, um, we have the, the other overflow shelter now um, in the Seaport area is um, up and running very smoothly, and um, we all have a part to play in this. This is not an issue that is going to be resolved without a lot of coordination yeah. from a lot of entities at all levels of government, and so I'm really grateful to the governor and her team for working so closely with us on the many facets and in all the ways that it's impacting our residents' daily lives, too. So before you go, uh, you love talking about zoning. I love talking about cigarettes, <laughs> uh, and I do. So Brookline just had their, I don't know if it's called their regulation, their ordinance, approved by the state's highest court, basically a lifetime ban. Uh, I would have thought in violation of the state's 21-year-old rule, but essentially if you're born after January 1st of the year 2000, you can't sell cigarettes in- Buy. Buy, my apologies, buy cigarettes in Brookline. What do you think of that approach to the public health issue of That's cigarette right. smoking? You could be 80 and not be able That's to buy right. cigarettes. That's right. What do you think, Mayor Wu? <laughs> yeah, um, a number of years ago, Boston had implemented a ban on flavored cigarettes mm -hmm. and um, flavored tobacco as a way to try to weave within what were the existing legal parameters. And we heard a lot that actually that was unfair because there are certain um, stores that then had a preference. Mm. So this, this can even the playing field in the name of public health. I think it's something that we all should be looking into. Excellent. Mayor good Ruth, to see thank you. Thank you very, very much nice for coming you in. Um, are you a good swimmer? Speaking of swim safe, are you a good swimmer? I hopped into the pool when, you, when we cut the ribbon in East Boston. I'm sure I'll be doing it again this <laughs> summer. I love that. It's great. I understand she does a mean dog paddle. I bet, <laughs> I no, I would bet she's a little better than that, actually. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, Mayor Good Ruth, to see for you, coming Mayor in. Thank, thank you so you much. for listening to another edition of Boston Public Radio. Thank you to people that came down to the Boston Public thank Library. Thank you all. We appreciate it. Keep up with us 24 7 boy of our podcast. Tomorrow, we're going to be back here at the Boston Public Library for our second Wednesday with our monthly transit panel, former Secretary of Transportation Jim Aloisi and Stacey Thompson from Livable Streets, Harvard National Security expert Juliet Kayyem, CNN's John King, and Jonah Mendez, retired CIA chief of disguise and co-author of Argo, her new member, her new memoir, excuse me, in True Face, A Woman's Life in the CIA, plus a special Wednesday music performance at the Boston Public Library. The folks from Brian O'Donovan Legacy Series join us ahead of St. Patrick's Day. It's going to be great. It will be great. We want to thank our crew, Zoe Matthews, Aidan Conley, Nicole Garcia, Hannah Loss, our engineer, John the Claw Parker, our executive producer, Jane Bologna. Special thanks to the BPL team, Maddie Geyer, Lance Douglas, Angelica Marrero, Sandra Lopez-Burke, Carly Corcoran, and Isabella Karen. Stay, stay tuned for the Culture Show, which is coming on right after the 2 o'clock news right here on 89.7. GBH, I'm Marjorie Egan. I'm Jim Browdy. Thanks again for tuning in today. Hope you can tune in tomorrow, and have a great afternoon.